going to start video when you're on stage. Stop video when you're off stage. I will read the character name. Please state your name. Tonight we are reading The Country Wife by William White Turley. Playing Witcherly, Mr. Yeah. I'm sorry? Witcherly. Witcherly yeah, sorry. by William Witcherly. What? <laughs> Playing Mr. Horner. Shaul Rick Chason. Playing Mr. Harcourt. Thomas Gruber. <clears throat> Playing Mr. Doralant will be Bernard Bozio. Playing Mr. Pinchwife. Thomas Kane. Oh, where's Thomas Kane? A big role. Oh, hold on. Uh... The forest has begun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a that's a role. Maybe the sonnets were too much for him. <laughs> <laughs> he was the non-drinker. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. You don't drink, you consistent. You couldn't take it. <laughs> but he also didn't snore in it, Tyler. <clears throat> Um, oh, snoring. I was on mute the whole time. We have time. a five o'clock reading. The Country Wife. <laughs> Shaul, did you study? Uh, it is ten after. Yeah, I, was just, I, I went to a, I was, I, was just, a, I went to English and Theater at School, and I kind of specialized in. No, um, we do Renaissance have Renaissance something at drama. eight at nine o'clock. I'm sorry. And, night. And, uh, I just kind of specialized in Renaissance and Restoration a, drama when I was at school. Oh, oh, okay. Which school? I went to UMass. Right, thank you. I wondered if this can be, um, st has it ever been staged uh, in with contemporary um, rather than uh, period costuming? Um, have, you, have you ever seen that? I don't know if I've ever seen, I don't know if I've ever seen the country wave staged contemporarily, but I know I've seen, um, oh, what's the name of the guy who wrote Way of the World and Love for Love? Um, Congreve, Con Congreve's plays, or I've oh, seen okay. those staged contemporarily. So I don't. I actually, it's funny. I'm a playwright, and I was writing a contemporary adaptation of The Country Wife. Oh, I want to yeah. play about a guy who marries a marries a more m naive Mormon woman from the Midwest and moves her to New York. Mm. <laughs> oh, by the way, by the way, is it, isn't there, isn't there a play on words with country? <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, a sort of a nasty play on words, Mary Elena. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought you'd appreciate no, I, I did. the country, the country wife. wife. <laughs> I love my country wife. If it was country, I could get it. But country, yeah. that's... Well, the country, country, country wife. Country. <laughs> Who knows how they pronounced it then? I don't know. <laughs> that was actually a common pun. There is a moment in Hamlet where Hamlet puts his leg on, put hand on Ophelia's legs and says, oh, you think I have country matters on my mind? Yes. Mm. Yes. Oh, shit. Mm. And that's, that's very... <laughs> Interesting. Did Tom realize... not? Did Tom not realize that this was at five? He had, he, oh. had no, he had no idea. He said, "I thought we had something at eight. I'm like, "No, we do have something else at nine. <laughs> we do. <laughs> but you have something at five now. <laughs> yes, I have another reading at nine. Yeah. What is it? At nine is called the Big Knife. Oh. Oh. How about we do like? like... Elena? What? What? I what? missed that one. You're a busy, busy woman. Keeping the big knife. The big knife was uh, an, an invited PDF. When an actor got a PDF and requested their own peeps, so mm -hmm. I put it up. If you bring me, if you bring me a PDF that you want to be in, I can't really put it out there for other people if you're precasting yourself. So you could precast yourself and then precast the other people, and we'll put it up. I'll put it up. I've done that uh, mm -hmm. before. There's no way for me to get PDFs, so, and if somebody's kind enough to scan something, I can't ask them to not be a part of it. So in those instances, maybe once or twice a week, this is what happens. Well, Mary Elena, I will offer this in um, uh, the, the contrary. If you are looking for a PDF, um, let me know. I'll 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 check it out. I have some access to. Um, Things. I teach at NYU. I have a lot of access to um, good resources. So sometimes I can track something down. Okay. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Uh, to, for educational purposes. That's exactly. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, in all seriousness, you know, this this for me is something that I can, uh, you know, later bring to people who want to put on plays and say, hey, here's a reading of it. Let's put it on. I'll show you how good it is. So it does. Yeah. It does. It does serve a real purpose yes. in in that I can hopefully get these plays some money for real money. You know, I'd love to see these things put up. I'm not uh, just doing it for the fuck of it. And it's keeping me all in practice, you know? Come on. Yes. That's... No, this has been so wonderful for me to, to you know, you read the play. How much, you, just you reading the play with other people. Yeah. Have that um, um, versatility to do all these different mm -hmm. roles. Well, learning about all these, some of these plays I didn't even, hadn't heard of that I'm like, oh my God, they're, I, and I want to see them produced. It's mm -hmm. really great. It helps me avoid my family. <laughs> mm. oh my God. All right, Thomas. Thomas has arrived. There's Bernie. Ah, uh, I, I uh, right on time. Right on time. <laughs> my apologies to everyone. Really, you are invisible, Mary Elena. Mary Elena, um, you have Taylor lips. What'd you say, Bernie? Bernie. I see you came in period costumes, huh? <laughs> oh, Listen, I'm glad I got clothes on. Oh. The sonnets had that kind of effect on you, huh? No, uh, I was busy in the process of starting to make dinner, and I, and I get this phone call from Maria Elena. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. You look like you were now. Hey, we're glad to see you. <laughs> I'm very sorry to, to be late. Okay. Sorry. If it was if it was a small little piece, I I kind of skip you, but I, I understand you have kind of a meaty role, so I, I I appreciate your actually being here. Quite right, you madam. Quite right. <laughs> Are you uh, my husband? I am Mr. Pinch wife. Oh my 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 my! All right, here we go again. Take two. The con. Oh, I got it. Wycherly? What'd you say? Witcherly? Wycherly? Wycherly. Wycherly. I think I think it's Witcherly, isn't it? Actually, yeah, I think it's Wycherly. Right. Oh well, I, I just heard it pronounced Witcherly. Oh, uh, anyway, Wycherly. Who knows? Tonight we are reading *The Country Wife* by William Wycherly, playing Mr. Horner. Shaul Rick Chason. Playing Mr. Harcourt. Thomas Gruber. Playing Mr. Dorilant. Uh, Mr. Bernard Bozio, and no, I'm not hungover. <laughs> the miracle. Playing, playing Mr. Pinchwife. Thomas Kane. Playing Mr. Sparkish. Michael Juno. Playing Sir Jasper Fidget. Stephen Ackerman. Playing Mrs. Marjorie Pinchwife. Emily Stone. Playing Mrs. Alethea. Jennifer Finger. Playing My Lady Fidget and Lucy. Liz Bow. Playing Mrs. Squeamish and Old Lady Squeamish. Ashley Vos. Playing a boy and a quack. Tyler Bogan. Playing Mrs. Dainty Fidget, Maria Elena. Uh, front Matter. Skip to the prologue. Yes. I can read a translation of the Front Matter if people want to hear it. Please, please. Horace, it makes me annoyed that a thing should be faulted, not for being crudely or clumsily made, but simply for being recent, and that praise and prizes should be asked for the old instead of forbearance. Nice. Poets, like cudgeled bullies, never do at first or second blow submit to you, but will provoke you still and ne'er have done, till you were weary first with laying on. The late so baffled scribbler of this day, though he stands trembling, bids me boldly say what we, before most plays are used to do. For poets, out of fear, first draw on you. In a fierce prologue, the still pit defy, and ere you speak, like Castrol, give the lie. But though our base's battles oft I've thought, and with brute's knuckles, their dear conquests bought, nay, 
never yet fear odds upon the stage. In prologue, dare not Hector with the age. But wounds take quarter from your saving hands, though bays within all yield in counterpass. Says you, confederate wits, no quarter give. Therefore his play shan't ask your leave to live. Well, let the vain rash fop, by huffing so, think to obtain the better terms of you. But we the actors humbly will submit, now and at any time, to a full pit. Nay, often we anticipate your rage, and murder poets for you on our stage. We set no guards upon our tiring room, but when with flying colors there you come, we patiently you see, give up to you, our poets, virgins, nay, our matrons too. <clears throat> Act one, scene one. Enter Horner and Quack, following him at a distance. A quack is as fit for a pimp as a midwife for a bod. They are still but in their way, both helpers of nature. Well, my dear doctor, hast thou done what I desired? Unmute. I have undone uh, you for forever with the woman and reported you throughout the whole town as bad as a eunuch, with as much trouble as if I had made you one in earnest. But have you told all the midwives you know, the orange wenches of the playhouses, the city husbands, and old fumbling keepers of this end of the town? For they'll be the readily, readiest to report it. I have told all the chambermaids, uh, waiting women, tire women, and old women of my acquaintance, Nay, and whispered it as a secret to him and to the whisperers of Whitehall, so that you need no doubt, twill spread and you will be as odious in the handsome young woman as... As the smallpox. Well. And to the married women of this end of the town as... As the great ones, nay, as their own husbands. And to the city dames as Annis Seed Robin of Filthy and contemptible, contemptible memory, and they will frighten their children with your name, especially their females. And cry, Horner's coming to carry you away. I am only afraid twill not be believed. You told him twas by an English-French disaster and an English-French surgeon, who has given me at once not only your cure, but an antidote for the future against that damned melody and that worse distemper, love, and all other women's evils. Your late journey into France has made it more credible, and your being here a fortnight before you appeared in public looks as if you apprehended the shame, which I wonder you do not. Well, I have been hired by young gallants to uh, belay them to a t'other way, but you are the first would be thought a man unfit for women. Dear Mr. Doctor, let vain rogues be contented only to be thought abler men than they are. Generally, it is all the pleasure they have, but mine lies another way. You take, methinks, a very pre preposterous way to it, uh, and as ridiculous as if he operators in Sisic should put forth bills to disparage our medic medicaments with hope to gain customers. Doctor, there are quacks in love, as well as physic, who get but the fewer and worse patients for their boasting. A good name is seldom got by giving it oneself, and women no more than honor are compassed by bragging. Come, come, doctor. The wisest lawyer never discovers the merits of his cause till the trial. The wealthiest man conceals his riches, and the cunning gamester his play. Shy husbands and keepers, like old rooks, are not to be cheated, but by a new unpractised trick. False friendship will pass now no more than false dice upon him. No, not in the city. There are two ladies and gentlemen coming up. A pox, some unbelievable sisters of my former acquaintance, who I am afraid, expect their sense should be satisfied mm. of the falsity of the report. Enter Sir Jasper Fidget, Lady Fidget, and Mrs. Dainty Fidget. No, this formal fool and women. His wife and sister. My coach breaking just now before your door, sir, I look upon as an occasional reprimand to me, sir, for not kissing your hands, sir, since you're coming out of France, sir, 
Excuse me. And so my disaster, sir, has been my good fortune, sir. And this is my wife and sister, sir. What then, sir? My lady and sister, sir. Wife, this is Master Horner. Master Horner? Husband? My lady, my fidget, sir. So, sir. Uh, won't you be acquainted with her, sir? So, the report is true. I find by his coldness or aversion to the sex, but I'll play the wag with him. Pray salute my uh, wife, my lady, sir. I will kiss no man's wife, sir, for him, sir. I have taken my eternal leave, sir, of the sex already, sir. Uh -huh. uh, I'll plague him yet. Not know my wife, sir? I do know your wife, sir. She's a woman, sir, and consequently a monster. Sir, a greater monster than a husband, sir. A husband? How, sir? No, so, sir. But I make no more cuckold, sir. Ha, ha, ha. Mercury, Mercury. Hey, Sir Jasper, let us be gone from this rude fellow. Who, by his breeding, would you think he had ever been in France? He's but too much a French fellow, such as hate women of quality and virtue for their love to their husbands, Sir Jasper. A woman is hated by him as much for loving her husband as for loving their money. But pray, let's be gone. You do well, madam, for I have nothing that you came for. I have brought over not so much as a body picture, a new postures, nor the second part of the Escole de Feed, nor... Hold for shame, sir. What do you mean? You'll ruin yourself forever with the sex. <laughs> he hates women perfectly, I find. What pity tis he should. Ah, he's a base rude fellow for it. But affectation makes not a woman more odious to them than virtue. Because your virtue is your greatest affectation, ma'am. <laughs> How, you saucy fellow. Would you wrong my honor? If I could. How do you mean, sir? <laughs> no, he can't wrong your ladyship's honor upon my honor. He, poor man, hark you in your ear, a mere eunuch. Oh, filthy beast. <laughs> Why do we stay here? Let, let, be, let be, let's be gone. I can't endure the sight of him. Stay, but till the chairs come, they'll be here presently. No, no. Nor can I stay longer Tis, let me see, a quarter and a half quarter of a minute past eleven. The council will be sate. I must weigh. Business must be preferred always before love and ceremony with the wise Mr. Horner. And the impotent Sir Jasper. Aye, aye, the impotent Master Horner. Ha, ha, ha. What? Leave us with a filthy man alone in his lodgings? He's an innocent man now, you know. Pray stay. I'll hasten the chairs to you. Mr. Horner, your servant, I should be glad to see you at my house. Pray, come and dine with me and play at cards with my wife after dinner. You are fit for women at that game, yet, ha ha, tis as much a husband's prudence to provide innocent diversion for a wife as to hinder her unlawful pleasures, and he had better employ her than let her employ herself. Uh, farewell. Your servant, Sir Jasper. I will not stay with him, fuck. Nay, madam, I beseech you stay. If it be but to see, I can be as civil to ladies yet, as they would desire. No, no, Papa, you, you cannot be civil to ladies. You as civil as ladies would desire. No, 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 Papa, 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 Papa. Thank you, that, Lady Fidget and Dainty. Now I think I, or you, or yourself, rather, have done your business with the women. Thou art an ass. Don't you see already upon the report into my carriage? This grave man of business leaves his wife in my lodgings, invites me to his house and wife, who before would not be acquainted with me out of jealousy. Nay, by this means you may be the more acquainted with the husbands, but the less with the wives. Let me alone. If I can but abuse the husbands, I'll soon disabuse the wives. Stay, I'll reckon you up the advantages. I am like to have by my strategy. First, I shall be rid of all my old acquaintances, the most insatiable sort of dumbs, that invade our lodgings in a morning. And next, to the pleasure of making a new mistress, is that of being rid of an old one, and of all old debts. Love, when it comes to be so, is paid the most unwillingly. 
Well, you may be so rid of your old acquaintances, but how will you get any new ones? Doctor, thou wilt never make a good chemist. Thou art so incredulous and impatient. Ask but all the young fellows of the town, if they do not lose more time, like huntsmen, in starting the game than in running it down. One knows not where to find them, who will or will not. Women of quality are so civil, you can hardly distinguish love from good breeding, and a man is often mistaken. But now I can be sure, she that shews an aversion to me loves the sport, as those women that are gone, whom I warrant to be right. And then the next thing is your women of honor, as you call them, are only chary of their reputations, not their persons, and to scandal they would avoid, not men. Now may I have, by the reputation of an eunuch, the privileges of one, and be seen in a lady's chamber, in the morning as early as her husband, kiss virgins before their parents or lovers, and may be, in short, the papartout of the town. Now, doctor. Nay, now you shall be the doctor, and your process is so new that we do not know, but it may succeed. Not so new neither, pro beta mest doctor. Well, I wish you luck and many patience whilst I go to mine. Exit quack, enter Harcourt and Dorland to Horn. Come, your appearance at the play yesterday has, I hope, hardened you for the future against the women's contempt and the men's raillery. And now you're the broad as you were one. Did I not bear it bravely? Oh, with a most theatrical impudence, nay, more than the orange wenches show there, or a drunken visit mask, or a great bellied actress, nay, or the most impudent of creatures, an ill poet, or what is yet more impudent, a second hand critic. <laughs> but what say the ladies? Have they no pity? What, ladies, uh, the visit masks, you, you know, never pity a man when all's gone, though in their service. And for the women in the boxes, you'd never pity them when twas in your power. Well, they say it is pity, but all that deal with common women should be served so. <laughs> Nay, I dare swear, they won't admit you to play at cards with them, go to plays with them, or do their little duties with each other's shadows of men, or what to do for them. <laughs> Who do you call shadows of men? Half boy. What, boys? I, your old boys, old beau garçon, who, like superannuated stallions, are suffered to run, feed, and whinny with the mares as long as they live, though they can do nothing else. <laughs> Well, a pox on love and wench. Women, sir, but to keep a man from better company, though I can't enjoy them. I shall you the more. Good fellowship and friendship are lasting, rational, and manly pleasures. Oh, that give me some of those pleasures you call effeminate, too. They help to relish one another. They disturb one another. No, mistresses are like books. If you pour upon them too much, they doze you and make you unfit for company. But <laughs> if you sweetly, you are the fitter for conversation by them. Um, a mistress should be like a little country retreat near the town, not to dwell in constantly, but only for a night and away to taste the town the better when a man returns. <laughs> yeah, I tell you, it is as hard to be a good fellow, a good friend, and a lover of women, as it is to be a good fellow, a good friend, and a lover of money. You cannot follow both, then choose your side. Wine gives you liberty, love takes it away. Gad, he's in the right on it. Wine gives you joy, love, grief, and tortures. Besides, the Churgan's wine makes us witty. Love only sots. Wine makes us sleep. Love breaks it. By the world, he has reason, Hawthorne. Wine makes... <laughs> aye, aye, wine makes us, makes us princes. Love makes us beggars, all rogues, he can. And wine... So there's one converted. No, no. 
love and wine, oil and vinegar. <laughs> I grant it, love will still be uppermost. Come, for my part, I will have only those glorious manly pleasures of being very drunk and very sloppy. <laughs> Mr. Sparkish is below, sir. What, my dear friend, a rogue that is fond of me, only I think for abusing him. <laughs> no, he can no more think the men laugh at him than the women jilt him. His opinion of himself is so good. <laughs> Well, there's another pleasure by drinking I thought not of. I shall lose his acquaintance because he cannot drink. And you know, it is a very hard thing to be rid of him, for he's one of those nauseous offerers at wit, who, like the worst fiddlers, run themselves into all companies. One that by being in the company of men of sense would pass for one. And may so in the short-sighted world, as a false jewel amongst true ones, is not discerned at a distance. His company is as troublesome to us as a cuckold's when you have a mind to his wife's. Uh, no, the rogue will not let us enjoy one another, but ravishes our conversation, though he signifies no, no more to it than Sir Martin Mo Morrill's gaping and awkward thrumming upon the lute, just to his man's voice and music. <laughs> and to pass for a wit in town, choose himself a fool every night to us that are guilty of the plot. <laughs> Such wits as he are to a company of reasonable men, like rooks to the gamesters, who only fill a room at the table, but are so far from contributing to the play that they only serve to spoil the fancy of those that do. Nay, they are used like rooks too, snubbed, checked and abused, yet the rogues will hang on. A pox on him, and all that force nature, and would be still what she forbids him. Affectation is her greatest monster. Most men are the contraries to that they would seem. Uh, your bully, you see, is a coward with a long sword. The little humbly fawning physician with his ebony cane is he that destroys men. The usurer, a poor rogue, possessed of moldy bonds and mortgages, and we they call spendthrifts, are only wealthy who lay out his money upon daily new purchases of pleasure. Aye, your errant is cheat, is your trustee or executor, your jealous man, the greatest cuckold, your churchman, the greatest atheist, and your noisy pert rogue of a wit, the greatest fop dullest ass, and worst company, as you shall see. For here he comes. Oh, is it, Sparks? How is it? Well, Harry, I, I must really rally a little. <laughs> Upon the report in town of the, uh, I can only think. Shall I speak? Yes, but you'll be so bitter then. Oh, on a stick and drunk. He shall answer for me. I will not be extreme bitter by the universe. He <laughs> will be bound in 10,000 pound bond. He shall not be bitter at all. Nor sharp, nor sweet. What, not downright insipid? Nay, then. Since you are so brisk and provoke me, take what follows. You must know I was discoursing and rallying with some ladies yesterday, and they happened to talk of the fine new signs in town. Very fine ladies, I believe. Ah, said I. I know where the best new sign is. <laughs> where, says one of the ladies, in Covent Garden. I replied said another. In what street? In Russell Street, answered I. Lord, says another, I'm sure there was never a fine new sign there yesterday. Yes, but there was, said I again, and it came out of France and has been there a fortnight. <sighs> I can hear no more, pretty. No, hear him out. Let him tune his crowd a while. Worst music, the greatest preparation. Oh, nay, faith, I'll make you laugh. 
It cannot be, said a third lady. Yes, yes, quoth I again, says a fourth lady. I'll look to it. We'll have no more ladies. No. Then mark. Mark now, said I to the fourth. Did you never see Mr. Horner? He lodges in Russell Street, and he's a sign of a man, you know, since since he came out of France. <laughs> but the devil take me, is thine be the sign of a jest? With that they all fell a laughing. <laughs> ah, till they be peace themselves. What? <laughs> but it does not move you, methinks. Well, See, one had as good go to law without a witness as break a jest without laughter on one side. Come, come, Fox, but where do we dine? I have left it wide all in Earl to dine with you. No, I, I thought thou hadst loved a man with a title better than a suit with a French trimming to it. Go to him again. No, sir. A wit to me is the greatest title in the world. But go dine with your earl, sir. He may be exceptious. We are your friends, and will not take it ill to be left, I do assure you. Nay, faith, he shall go to him. Nay, pray, gentlemen. We'll thrust you out if you will not. What disappoint anybody for us? Dear, dear gentlemen, hear me. No, no, sir. By no means. Pray go, sir. Why, dear rogues. They all thrust him out of the room. No, no, no. Spox, <laughs> 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 pray hear me. What do you think? I'll eat them with gay, shallow fops and silent coxcombs? I think wit as necessary at dinner as a glass of good wine. And that's the reason I never have any stomach when I eat alone. Come, but where do we dine? Even where you will. At Chantelines. Yes, if you will. Or at the cock. Yes, if you please. Mm. Or at the dog in Pottridge. Aye, if you have minds to it, for we shall dine at neither. Oh, sure, with your fooling, we shall lose the new play. And I won't no more miss selling a new play the first day. Then I won't miss settling in the witch rose. Therefore, I'll go fetch my mistress and away. Exit Sparkish. Minette, Horner, Harcourt, Dorland. Enter to them, Mr. Pinchwife. Who have we here, Pinchwife? Gentlemen, your humble servant. Well, Jack, by thy long absence from the town, the grumness of thy countenance, and the slovenliness of thy habit, I should give thee joy, should I not, of marriage? Death does he know I'm married too. I'd have thought to conceal it from him at least. Ah, oh, my long stay in the country will excuse my dress, and I have a suit of law that brings me up to town, that puts me out of humour. Besides, I must give Sparkish tomorrow five thousand pounds to lie with my sister. Oh. Nay, you country gentlemen, rather than not purchase, will buy anything, and he is a cracked title, if we may quibble. Well, but I am to give thee joy, I heard thou wert married. What then? Why, the next thing that is to be heard is thou art a cuckold. <coughs> Insupportable name! But I did not expect marriage from such a whoremaster as you, one that knew the town so much and women so well. Why, I have married no London wife. <laughs> That's all one. That grave circumspension in marrying a country wife is like refusing a deceitful, pampered Smithfield jade to go and be cheated by a friend in the country. Apart from him in this simile. At least we are a little surer of the breed there. Know what our keeping has been, whether foiled or unsound. Come, come. I have known a clap gotten in Wales, and there are cousins, justices, clerks, and chaplains in the country. I won't say coachmen, but she's handsome and young. I'll answer as I should do. 
No, no, but she has no beauty but her youth, not a, no attraction but here modesty, wholesome, homely, huswifely, and that's all. Mm. He talks like a gracia as he looks. She's too suckered, uh, ill-favored, and silly to bring to town. Then he thinks you should bring her to be taught reading. To be taught? No, sir, I thank you. Good wives and private shoulders, soldiers should be ignorant. I'll keep her from your instructions, I warrant you. The rogue is as jealous as if his wife were not ignorant. <laughs> Why, if she be ill-favored, there will be less danger here for you than by leaving her in the country. We have such variety of dainties that we are seldom hungry. Now, oh, but uh, they have always caused constant swinging stomachs in the country. Foul feeders indeed. <clears throat> and your hospitality is great there. Open house, every man's welcome. So, so, gentlemen. But prithee, why wouldst thou marry her? If she be ugly, ill-bred, and silly, ah, she must be rich then. As rich as if she bought me twenty thousand pound out of this town, for she be as sure not to spend her moderate portion, as a London baggage wouldn't be to spend hers. Let it be what it would, so to all this one. Then because she's ugly, she's the likelier to be mine own. And being ill-bred, she'll hate conversation. And since silly and innocent, will not know the difference betwixt a man of one and twenty and one and forty. Nine, to my knowledge. But if she be silly, she'll expect as much from a man of forty-nine as from him of one and twenty. But methinks wit is more necessary than beauty, and I think no young woman ugly that has it, and no handsome woman agreeable without it. It's my maxim. He's a fool that marries, but he's a greater that does not marry a fool. What is wit in a wife good for, but to make a man a cuckold? Yes, to keep it from his knowledge. A fool cannot contrive to make her husband a cuckold. No, but she'll club with a man that can. And what's worse, if she cannot make her husband a cuckold, she'll make him jealous and pass for one. And then it is all one. Well, well, I'll take care for one. My, my wife shall make me no cuckold, though she had your help, Mr. Horner. I understand the town, sir. <laughs> His help. <laughs> He's come newly to town, it seems, and has not heard how things are with him. But tell me, has marriage cured thee of whoring, which it seldom does? Tis no more than age can do. No, the word is, I'll marry and live honest. But a marriage vow is like a penitent gamester's oath. And entering into bonds and penalties to stint himself is such a particular small sum at play for the future, which makes him but the more eager, and not being able to hold out, loses his money again and is forfeit to boot. Aye, aye, a gamester will be a gamester while his money lasts, and a whoremaster whilst his vigor. <laughs> Nay, I have known them when they are broke and can lose no more, keep a fumbling with the box in their hands to fool with only, and hinder other gangsters. That had the wherewithal to make lusty mistakes. Well, gentlemen, you may laugh at me, but you shall never lie with my wife. I know the town. But was not the way you were in better in not keeping better than marriage? Box on it! The jades would jilt me. I could never keep a whore to myself. Ah, so then you only married to keep a whore to yourself. Well, but let me tell you, women, as you say, are like soldiers made constant and loyal by good pay, rather than by oaths and covenants. Therefore, I'd advise my friends to keep rather than marry, since too I find by your example it does not serve one's turn. For I saw you yesterday in the 18 penny place with a pretty country wench. How's it? Devil, did he see my wife then? I say there might she might not be seen, but she shall never go to a play again. What dost thou blush at nine and forty for having been seen with a wench? No, no faith, I warrant. Twas his wife, which he seated there out of sight, for he's a cunning rogue and understands the cow. <laughs> he blushes that. "'Twas his wife, for men are now more ashamed to be seen with them in public than with a wench. 
Hell in damnation, I'm undone, since Sorna has seen her, and they know twas she. But prithee, was it thy wife? Oh, she was exceedingly pretty. I was in love with her at that distance. You are like never to be nearer to her, your servant, gentlemen. Nay, prithee stay. I cannot, I will not. Come, you shall dine with us. I have dined already. Come, I know thou hast not. I'll treat thee, dear rogue. Thou shan't spend none of thy Hampshire money today. Treat me? So he uses me already like his cuckold. Nay, you shall not go. I must. I have business at home. To beat his wife. He's as jealous of her as cheap side husband of a covent garden wife. Why, tis as hard to find an old whoremaster without jealousy of the gout as a young one without fear of the pox. As gout in age from pox in youth proceeds, so wenching past, then jealousy succeeds, the worst disease that love and wenching breeds. Pray, sister, what are the best fields and woods to walk in in London? Sister. What sister? Mulberry Garden in St. James Park and for close walks in New Exchange. Pray, sister, tell me why my husband looks so rum here in town and why he keeps me up so close and will not let me go walking nor let me wear my best gown yesterday. No, oh, he's jealous, sister. Jealous? What's that? He's afraid you should love another man. How should he be afraid of my loving another man when he will not let me see any but himself? Did he not carry you yesterday to a play? I, but he sate among ugly people. He would not let me come near the gentry who sate under us so that I could see him. He told me none but naughty women sate there whom they tossed and moused, but I would have ventured for all that. But how did you like the play? Indeed, I was weary of the play, but I'd hugely, I liked hugely the actors. They are the goodliest, properest men, sister. Oh, but you must not let them the actor, sister. I, how should I help it, sister? Pray, sister, when my husband comes in, will you ask leave for me to go a walking? A walking? Ha, ha. Lord, a country gentlewoman's le leisure is a drudgery of a footpost, and she requires as much airing as her husband's horses. But here comes your husband. I'll ask, though I'm sure he'll not grant it. He says he won't let me go abroad for fear of catching the pox. Fie, the smallpox, you should say. Oh, my dear, dear bud, welcome home. How dost thou look so froppish? Was thou naggard? What has naggard thee? You're a fool. Say, so she is for crying for no fault, poor tender creature. What? What, you would have her as impudent as yourself, as errant a jill flirt, a gadder, a magpie, and to say all <laughs> a mere notorious town woman? Brother, you are my only censurer, and the honor of your family shall sooner suffer in your wife there than in me. Though I take the innocent liberty of the town. Art you, mistress, do not talk before my wife the innocent liberty of the town. Why, pray, who boasts of any intrigue with me? What lampoon has made my name notorious? What do women frequent my lodgings? I keep no company with any women of scandalous reputations. No, you keep the men of scandalous reputations company. Where? Would you not have me civil? Answer them in the box of the plays, in the drawing room of Whitehall, and St. James's Park, Mulberry Garden, or... So, old ho, do not teach my wife where the men are to be found. I believe she's the worst for your town documents already. I bid you keep her in ignorance, as I do. Indeed, do not be angry with her, bud. She will tell me nothing of the town, though I ask her a thousand times a day. 
Then you are very inquisitive to know, I find. Not I, indeed, dear. I hate London. Our place house in the country is worth a thousand of it. Would I were there again. So you shall, I warrant. But you were not talking of plays and players when I came in. Hmm? You are encouraging her in her discourses. No, indeed, dear. She chid me just now for liking the player men. Nay, if she be so innocent as to owe to me her liking them, there is no hurt in it. Come, my poor rogue, but thou likest none better than me? Yes, indeed, but I do. The player men are finer folks. But you love none better than me. You are my... Own dear bud, and I know you. I hate a stranger. Aye, my dear, you must love me only, and not be like the naughty town women who only hate their husbands and love every man else, love plays, visits, fine coaches, fine clothes, fiddles, balls, treaties, and so lead a wicked town life. Nay, if to enjoy all these things be a town life, London is not so bad a place. How? Oh, if you love me, you must hate London. The fool has forbid me discovering to her the pleasures of the town, and he is now sending her a gog upon them himself. But husband, do town women love the player men? Yes, I warrant you. I, I warrant you. Why, you do not, I hope. No, no, but... But why have we no player men in the country? <laughs> Mrs. Minx, ask me no more to go to a play. Nay, why, love? I do not care for going, but when you forbid me, you make me as were desired. <clears throat> this will be in other things I want. Pray, let me go to a play, dear. Hold your peace, I will not. Why, love? Why? I'll tell you. Nay, if he tell her, she'll give him more cause to forbid her that place. Pray, why, dear? First, you like the actors, and the gallants may like you. What? A homely country girl? No, but nobody likes me. I tell you, yes, they may. No, no, you jest. I won't believe you. I will go. I tell you, then that one of the lewdest fellows in towns who saw you there told me he was in love with you. Indeed. Who, 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 who was it? I've gone too far and slipped before I was aware how of a joy she is. <laughs> Why, was it any Hampshire gallant, any of the neighbors? I promise you, I am beholding with him. <laughs> I promise you, you lie, for he won't ruin you as he has done hundreds. He has no other love for women, but that such as he look upon women like basilisks, but to destroy them. Why, but he loves me. Why should he ruin me? Answer me to that. Me thinks he should not. I would do him no harm. Ha, ha, ha. Tis very well, but I'll keep him from doing you any harm or me either. And to spark is in our court. Here comes company. Get you in. Get you in. Pray, husband, is it a pretty gentleman that loves me? In baggage. In. He thrusts her in and shuts the door. What all the lewd libertines of the town brought to my lodging by this Cassie Coxcomb? Steph, I'll not suffer it. Ah, here, Harcourt. Do you approve my choice? Oh, dear little rogue, I told you. I bring you acquainted with all my friends, the wits and... Our court salutes her. Aye, they shall know her as well as you yourself will, I warrant you. Ah, this is one of those, my pretty rogue, that are to dance at your wedding tomorrow. And him you must bid farewell ever to what you and I have. Monstrous! Ah, our court... How dost thou like her? They? Nay, dear, do not look down. I should hate to have a wife of mine out of countenance at any time. Wonderful. Tell me, 
I say, Harcourt, how dost thou like her? Thou hast starred upon her enough to resolve me. So infinitely well that I could wish I had a mistress too that might differ from her in nothing but her love and engagement to you. Sir, Mr. Sparkish has often told me that his queens were all wits and railers. Now I find it. No, by the universe, madam, he does not rally now. You may believe him. I do assure you he is the honestest, worthiest, true-hearted gentleman. A man of such perfect honor. He would say nothing to a lady. He does not mean. Freezing another man to his mistress? Sir, you are so beyond expectation obliging that. Nay, I, I can't. I am sure you do admire her extremely. I cease in your eyes. He does admire you, madam, by the world, don't you? Yes, above the world, or the most glorious part of it. Her whole sex, and till now, I never thought I should have envied you or any man about to marry. But you have the best excuse for marriage I ever knew. Nay, now, sir, I'm satisfied you are of the society of the wits and railers, since you cannot spare your friend, even when he is but too civil to you. But the surest sign is, since you are an enemy to marriage, that I hear you hate as much as business or bad wine. Uh, truly, madam, I never was an enemy to marriage till now, because marriage was never an enemy to me before. Well, why, sir, is marriage an enemy to you now? Because it robs you of your friend here, for you look upon a friend married as one gone into a monastery that is dead to the world. Uh, Tis indeed because you marry him. I see, madam, you can guess my meaning. <laughs> I do confess heartily and openly, I wish it were in my power to break the match. Oh, by heavens, I would. Poor Frank! Oh. Would you be so unkind to me? Uh, no, no, tis not because I would be unkind to you. Uh, but, 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 poor Frank, no, Cad, tis only his kindness to me. Great kindness to you indeed, insensible fop. Let a man make love to his wife, to his face? Ah, oh, come, dear Frank, for all my wife there that shall be, thou shalt enjoy me sometimes, dear Rogue. By my honor, we men of wit condole for our deceased brother in marriage, as much as for one dead in earnest. I think that was prettily said of me. <laughs> my God! But come, Frank, he not, not melancholy for me. No, oh, I assure you, I am not melancholy for you. Mm. Really, Frank, dost think my wife that shall be there a fine person? I could gaze upon her till I became as blind as you are. Oh, and as I am now? How? Because you are a lover, and true lovers are blind, stock blind. Uh, true, true, but by the world, she has wit too, as well as beauty. <laughs> go, go with her into a corner and try if she has wit. Talk to her anything. She's bashful before me. Indeed, if a woman wants wit in a corner, she has, she has it nowhere. <laughs> Sir, you dispose of me a little before your time. Nay, nay, madam, let me have an earnest of your obedience, or, or, or go, go, madam. Oh, sir, if you are not concerned for the honor of a wife, a wife I am for that of a sister. You shall not debauch her. Be a pander to your own wife. Bring men to her, let them make love before your face, thrust them into a corner together, then leave them in private? Is this your town wit and conduct? <laughs> oh, a silly, raw, wise rogue would make one laugh more than a stock fool. <laughs> I shall burst. Nay, you shall not disturb him. 
I'll vex thee by the world. <laughs> Struggles with Pinch to keep him from the Hark and Alithia. Writings are drawn, sir. Settlements made. Tis too late, sir, and past all revocation. And so is my death. I would not be unjust to him. Then why so to? Well, then why to, why to me so? I have no obligation to you. My love. I had his before. You never had it. He wants you see jealousy, the only infallible sign of it. Love proceeds from esteem. He cannot distrust my virtue. Besides, he loves me or he will not marry me. Marrying you is no more sign of his love than bribing your woman that he may marry you is a sign of, of his generosity. Marriage is rather a sign of interest than love, and he that marries a fortune covets a mistress, not loves her. But if you take marriage for the sign of love, take it from me immediately. No, now you put a scruple in my head. But in short, sir, to end our dispute, I must marry him. My reputation would suffer in the world else. No, if you do marry him, with your pardon, madam, your reputation suffers in the world and you would be thought in necessity for a cloak. Nay, now you are rude, sir. Mr. Sparkish, pray come hither. Your friend here is very troublesome and very loving. Oh, oh, you hear that? Why, do, do you think I seem to be jealous? Like, like a country bumpkin? No, rather be a cuckold, like a credulous kit. Madam, you would not have been so little generous as to have told him. Yes, since you could be so little generous as to wrong him. Wrong him? No man can do it. He's beneath an injury, a bubble, a coward, a senseless idiot, a wretch so contemptible to all the world, but you, that... Hold. Do not rail at him. For since he is like to be my husband, I am resolved to like him. Nay, I think I am obliged to tell him you are not his friend. Master Sparkish, Master Sparkish. Oh, what, what now, dear rogue, has, has not she wit? Not so much as I thought and hoped she had. Mr. Sparkish, do you bring people to rail at you? Madam. No, how? No, no but, but if he does rail at me, tis but in jest I want. What we wits do for one another and never take any notice of it. He spoke so scurrilously of you, I had no patience to hear him. Besides, he has been making love to me. True damn tell-tale woman. Oh, for sure. To shrew his parts. We wits rail and make love often, but to shrew our parts. As we have no affections, so we have no malice, we, uh, he said, you are a wretch below an injury. What? Damned, senseless, impudent, virtuous jade. Well, since she won't let me have her, she'll do as good. She'll make me hate her. A common bubble. A pshaw. A coward. A pshaw, pshaw. <laughs> a senseless, dribbling idiot. How, how did he disparage my parts? Nay, then my honor's concerned. I can't put up that, sir. By the world, brother, help me to kill him. I may draw now, since we have the odds of him. It is a good occasion to be for my mistress. Hold, hold. No, what, what? I must not let him kill the gentleman neither for his kindness to me. I am so far from hating him that I wish my gallant had his person and understanding. Mm, nay, I'll, my nay I'll, I'll be thy death. Hold, hold. Indeed, to tell the truth, the gentleman said after all that what we spoke was but out of friendship to you. Oh, but say, say, say I, I am, I, I am a fool. That is no wit out of friendship to me. Yes, 
to try whether I was concerned enough for you and made love to me only to be satisfied of my virtue for your sake. Fine, however. Nay, if, if it were so, my dear rogue, I ask thee pardon. But why would not you tell me, Faith? Because I did not think Aunt's face. Come, on, it does not come. Oh, Tarkord, let's be done to the new play. Come, madam. I go. If you intend to leave me alone in the box and run into the pit as you used to do. Be sure. I'll leave Harcourt with you in the box to entertain you, and that's as good. If I set you in the box, I shan't be thought no judge, but of trimmings. Come away, Harcourt. Lead her down. Exeunt Sparkish, Harcourt, and Alethea. Well, go thy ways, for the flower of the true town fops, such as spend their estates before they come to them, and are cuckolds before they are married. But let me go look to my own freehold. Out. Enter my lady Fidget, Mistress Dainty Fidget, and Mistress Squeamish. You're a servant, sir. Where is your lady? We, we are come to wait upon her to uh, the new play. New play? And my husband will wait upon you, personally. Damn your Presently. civility. Madam, by no means I will not see Sir Jasper here till I have waited upon him at home. Nor shall my wife see you till she has waited upon your ladyship at your lodgings. Now we are here, sir. No, madam. Pray, let us see her. We will not stir, sir, till we see her. A box on your wall. Goes to the door and returns. She has locked the door and is gone abroad. No, you have locked the door and she's within. They told us below she was here. Well, nothing to... Well, it must out then to tell you the truth. Ladies, which I have a... Fr I was afraid to let you know before, at least it might endanger your lives. My wife has just now the smallpox come out upon her. Do, do not be frightened, but pray. Be gone, ladies. You shall not stay here in danger of your lives. Pray, get you gone, ladies. No, no. We have all had a... A luck, a luck. Come, come, we must see how it goes with her. I understand the disease. Come. Well, there is no being too hard for women at their own weapon lying. Therefore, I'll quit the field. Back. <laughs> Here is an example of jealousy. Indeed, as the world goes, I wonder there are no more jealous since wives are so neglected. Pshaw, sure, as the world goes, to what end should they be jealous? <laughs> it's a nasty world. That men of parts, great acquaintance and quality, should take up with and spend themselves and fortunes in keeping little playhouse creatures for. <laughs> Nay, that women of understanding, great acquaintance and good quality should fall a keeping too of little creatures. Huh. Uh, what? Tis the men of quality's fault. Never visit women of honor and reputation as they us to do, and have not so much as common civility for ladies of our rank, but use us with the same indifferency and ill breeding as if we were all married to him. She says true. Tis an errant shame women of quality should be so slighted. Methinks birth, uh, birth should go for something. I have known men admired, courted, and followed for their titles only. Aye, one would think men of honor should not love more than marry out of their own rank. Fie, fie upon them. They are come to think cross-breeding for themselves best, as well as for their dogs and horses. They are dogs and horses for it. One would think, if not for love, for vanity a little. Nay, they do satisfy their vanity upon us sometimes, and are kind to us in their report. Tell all the world they lie with us. Damned rascals, that we should be only wronged by them. To report a man has had a person when he has not had a person is the greatest wrong in the whole world that can be done to a person. Well, it is an errant shame. Noble persons should be so wronged and neglected. But still... "'Tis an errant shame for a noble person to neglect her own honor and defame her own noble person with little inconsiderable fellows. Huh. 
I suppose <laughs> the crime against our honor is the same with a man of quality as with another. How? No, sure, the man of quality is likeliest one's husband, and therefore the fault should be the less. But then the pleasure should be the less. Fie, 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 for shame, sister. Whither shall we ramble? Be continent in, in, in your discourse, or I shall hate you. Besides, an intrigue is so much more the, so much the more notorious for the man's quality. Here's true. Nobody takes notice of a private man, and therefore with it, tis more secret than the crime the less when tis not known. You say true, I faith. I think you are in the right on it. Tis not an injury to a husband till it be an injury to our honors, so that a woman of honor loses no honor with a private person and to say truth so the little fellow was grown to a private person with her but still my dear dear honor ah my dear dear honor thou hast still so much honor in thy mouth <laughs> that she has none elsewhere oh what do you mean to bring in these upon us Oh, these are as bad as wits. Four. Let us leave the room. Stay, stay. Faith to tell you the naked truth. Fie, Sir Jasper. Do not use that word, naked. Well, well, in short, I have business at Whitehall and cannot go to the play with you. Therefore, would have you go... With those two? To a play? No, not with the, the other, but with Mr. Horner. There can be no more scandal to go with him than with Mr. Petal or Master Limberham. With that nasty fellow? No, no. Nay, prithee dear, hear me. <sighs> Ladies? Stand off. Do not approach us. You heard with the wits, you are obscenity all over. Ooh. And I would as soon look upon a picture of Adam and Eve without fig leaves as any of you, if I could help it. Therefore, keep off and do not make us sick. What a devil are these? <laughs> Why, these are pretenders to honor, as crickets to it, only by censoring others, and as every raw, peevish, out of humored, affected, dull, tea drinking, arithmetical fop sets up for wit by railing at men of sense, so these for honor by railing at the court and the ladies of as great honor as qualified. Um, Mr. Horner, I must desire you to go with these ladies to the place, sir. I, sir? I, I come, sir. I must beg your pardon, sir. And theirs. I will not be seen in women's company in public again for the world. Ha <laughs> Strange aversion. No, he's for women's company in private. He, poor man. Ha, 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 ha. a great... Greater shame amongst lewd fellows to be seen in virtuous women's company than for the women to be seen with them. Indeed, madam. The time was I only hated virtuous women, but now I hate the other two. I beg your pardon, ladies. You are very obliging, sir, because we would not be troubled with you. In sober sadness he shall go. Nay, if he were not... I am ready to wait upon the ladies and think I am the finer man. <laughs> uh, you, sir, no, I thank you for that. Master Horner is a privileged man among the virtuous ladies. It will be a great while before you are so... <laughs> uh, he's my wife's gallant. <laughs> no, uh, pray withdraw, sir, for, as I take it, the virtuous ladies have no business with you. Hmm. And I am sure... He can have none with them. <laughs> Tis strange a man can come among virtuous women now, but upon the same terms as men are admitted into the great tax seraggio. <laughs> well, but heavens keep me from being an ombre player with them. But um, where is Pinchwife? Come, come, man. What avoid the sweet society of womankind? That sweet, soft, gentle, tame, noble creature woman made for man's companion. So is that soft, gentle, tame, and more noble creature a spaniel, and has all their tricks, can fawn, lie down, suffer beating, 
and fawn the more. Barks at your friends when they come to see you, makes your bed hard, gives you fleas, and the manage sometimes, and the mange sometimes. And all the difference is the spaniel is the more faithful animal and fawns but upon one master. <laughs> oh, the rude beast. Insolent brute. Brute! Stinking, mortified, rotten French weather. To hold, dare. hold, and please your ladyship, for shame, master. Honor, your mother was a woman. Now I shall never reconcile them. Hawk, you, madam, take my advice in your anger. You know you often want one to make up uh, your doling pack your drawing pack of ombre players, and you may cheat him easily, for he's an ill gamester with and consequently loves play. Besides, you know, you have but two old civil gentlemen with stinking breaths, too, to wait upon you abroad, taking the third into your service. The other are but crazy, and a lady should have a supernumerary gentleman usher as a supernumerary coach horse. At least sometimes you should be forced to stay at home. But are you sure he loves play and has money? He loves play as much as you and has money as much as I. Then I am contented to make him pay for his scurrility. Money makes up, in a measure, all other wants in men. <laughs> Those whom we cannot make hold of for gallants, we make fine. So, so, now to mollify, to wheedle him. Uh, Master Horner, will you never keep civil company? Methinks tis time now, since you are only fit for them. Come, come, man, you must even fall to visiting our wives, eating at our tables, drinking tea with our virtuous relations after dinner, doing cards to them, reading plays and gazettes to them, picking fleas out of their shocks for them, and collecting receipts, new songs, women pages, and footmen for them. I hope they'll afford me better employment, sir. <laughs> Tis fit you know your work before you come into your place. And since you are unprovided of a lady to flatter and a good house to eat at, pray frequent mine and call my wife mistress, She and she shall call you gallant, according to the custom. Who, I? Faith, thou shalt for my sake. Come for my sake only. For your sake. Come, come, he is a gamester for you. Let him be a little familiar sometimes. Nay, what if a little rude? Gamesters may be rude with ladies, you know. Yes, losing gamesters have a privilege with women. I always thought the contrary, that the winning gamester had most privilege with women. For when you have lost your money to a man, you'll lose anything you have, all you have, they say, and he may use you as he pleases. <laughs> well... Win or lose, you shall have your liberty with her. As he behaves himself, and for your sake I'll give him admittance and freedom. All sorts of freedom, madam? Aye, 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 all sorts of freedom thou canst take. And so go to her, begin thy new employment, wheedle her, jest with her, and be better acquainted one with another. I think I know her already. Therefore, may venture with her, my secret for hers. Sister Cuz, I have provided an innocent playfellow for you there. Who, he? There's a playfellow indeed. Yes, sure. What he is good enough to play at cards, blind man's bluff, or the fool with sometimes. Pa, oh, we'll have no such playfellows. No, sir, you shan't choose playfellows for us. We thank you. Nay, pray hear me. But... Poor gentleman, could you be so generous, so truly a man of honor, as for the sakes of us women of honor, to cause yourself to be reported no man, no man, and to suffer yourself the greatest shame that could fall upon a man, that none might fall upon us women by your conversation, but indeed, sir, as perfectly, perfectly the same man as before you're going to France. Sir, as perfectly, perfectly, sir. As perfectly, perfectly, madam. Nay, I scorn you should take my word. I desire to be tried only, madam. Well, that's spoken again like a man of honor. All men of honor desire to come to the test. But indeed, generally you men report such things of yourselves. 
uh, one does not know how or whom to believe, and it has come to that pass, we dare not take your words no more than your tailors, without some staid servant of yours be bound with you. But I have so strong a faith in your honor, dear, dear noble sir, that I'd forfeit mine for yours at any time, dear sir. Oh, no, madam. You should not need to forfeit it for me. I have given you security already to save you harmless my late reputation being so well known in the world, madam. But if upon any future falling out, or upon a suspicion of my taking the trust out of your hands to employ some other, you yourself should betray your trust, dear sir, I, I mean, if you'll give me leave to speak obscenely, you might tell me, dear sir. If I did, nobody would believe me. The reputation of impotency is as hardly recovered again in the world as that of cowardice, dear madam. Nay, then, as one may say, you may do your worst, dear, dear sir. Um, is your ladyship reconciled to him yet? Have you agreed on matters, for I must be gone to Whitehall? Why, indeed, Sir Jasper, Master Horner is a thousand, thousand times a better man than I thought him. Uh, uh, cousin Squeamish, uh, Sister Dainty, I can name him now. Truly, not long ago, you know, I thought his very name obscenity, and I would as soon have lain with him as have named him. Very likely, poor madam. I believe it. No doubt on it. Well, well, that your ladyship is as virtuous as any she, I know, and him all the town knows. <laughs> Therefore, now you like him, get you gone to your business together, go, go to your business, I say pleasure, whilst I go to my pleasure, business. Come then, Gallant, dear Gallant. Come away, my dearest mistress. So, so, why, tis as I'd have it. And as I... I, Lady Fidget, who for his business from his wife will run, takes the best care to have her business done. Act three, scene one. Alethea and Mrs. Pinchwife. Mr. What ails you? You are grown melancholy. Would it not make anyone melancholy to see you go every day fluttering about abroad while I, I must stay here like a poor, lonely, sullen bird in a cage? My sister, but you came young and just from the nest to your cage, so that I thought you liked it and could be cheerful in it, as others that took their flight themselves early and are hopping abroad in the open air. Nay. I confess I was quiet enough till my husband told me what pure lives the London ladies live abroad with their dancing, meetings, and junketings, and dressed every day in their best gowns. I warrant you play at nine pins every day of the week, so they do. Come, what's here to do? You are putting the town pleasures in her head and setting her in longing. Oh, yes, after nine pence. You suffer none to give her those lodgings you mean, longings you mean, but yourself. I'll tell her the vanities of the town like a confessor. A confessor? Just such a confessor as he that by forbidding of silly Elslor to grease the horse's teeth taught him to do it. <laughs> Come, Mistress Flippant. Good precepts are lost when bad examples are still before us. The liberty you take abroad makes her hanker after it, and out of humor at home, poor wretch. She desired not to come to London. I would bring her. Very well. She has been this week in town and never desired till this afternoon to go abroad. Was she not at a play yesterday? Yes, but she never asked me. I was myself the cause of her going. Then if she asks you again, you are the cause of her asking and not my example. Well, tomorrow night I shall be rid of you, and the next day before this light, and she and I will be rid of the town and my dreadful apprehensions. Come, be not melancholy, for thou shan't go into the country after to tomorrow, dearest. Great comfort. Ish. 
Why did you tell me of the country for? How's this? What? Pish is a country? Let me alone. I'm not well. Oh, if that be all, what ails my dearest? Maybe I don't know. But I have not been well since you told me there was a gallant at the play in love with me. Ha! That's by my example, too. Nay, if you are not well, but are so concerned because a lewd fellow chanced to lie, say he liked you, you'll make me sick, too. Of what sickness? Of that which is worse than the plague. Jealousy. Pish, you jeer. I'm sure there's no such disease in our receipt book at home. No, thou never met with it, poor innocent. Well, if thou cuckold me, twill be my own fault. For cuckolds and bastards are generally makers of their own fortune. Well, but pray, bud, let's go to a play tonight. Tis just done she comes from it. But why are you so eager to see a play? Faith, dear, not that I care one pin for their talk there, but I like to look upon the player, ma'am, and would see if I could the gallant you say loves me. That's all, dear bud. Is that all, dear bud? This proceeds from my example. But if the play be done, let's go abroad however, dear bud. Come, have a little patience, and thou shalt go to the country on Friday. Therefore, I would see a, first some sights to tell my neighbors of. Nay, I will go abroad. That's once. And I'm the cause of this desire, too. Well, now I think on it. Who was the cause of Horner's coming to my lodging today? That was you. No, you, because you would not let him see your handsome wife out of your lodging. Why? Oh, Lord, did the gentleman come hither to see me indeed? No, no, you are not cause of that damn question too, mistress. Alethea, well, she's in the right of it, but he is in love with my wife and comes after her. Tis so, but I'll nip his love in the bud lest he should follow us into the country and break his chariot wheel near our house on purpose for an excuse to come to it. But I think I know the town. Come, pray, bud, let's go abroad before tis late. For I will go, that's flat and plain. So, the obstinacy already of a town wife, and I must, while she's here, humor her like one? Sister, how shall we do that she may not be seen or known? Let her put on a mask. Oh, pshaw. A mask makes people but the more inquisitive, and is as ridiculous a disguise as a stage beard. Her shape, stature, habit will be known. And if we should meet with Horner, he would be sure to take the acquaintance with us. Must witch her joy, kiss her, talk to her, leer upon her, and the devil in all. And, I, and No, I'll not use her to a mask. Tis dangerous, for masks have made more cuckolds than the best faces that ever were known. How will you do that? Nay, shall we go? The exchange will be shut, and I have a mind to see that. So, I have it. I'll dress her up in this suit. We are to carry down to her our brother, little Sir James. Nay, I'll understand the town tricks. Come, let's dress her. A mask? No. A woman mask, like a covered dish, gives a man curiosity and appetite. When it may be uncovered, t'would turn his stomach. No, no. Indeed, your comparison is something a greasy one. But I had a gentle gallant used to say, a beauty mask like the sun in eclipse gathers together more gazers than if it shined out. <clears throat> the scene changes to the new exchange in mm. Warner, Harcourt, and Dorland. Engage to women and not sup with us. Aye, a pox on them all. You were much a more reasonable man in the morning and had as noble resolutions against them as a widower of weeks liberty. Did I ever think to see you keep company with women in vain? In vain? No. Tis, since I can't love them, be revenged on them. <laughs> now your sting is gone. You looked in the <laughs> box amongst all those women like a drone in a hive all upon you shoved and ill-used by them all and thrust from one side to the other. Ah, yet he must be 
buzzing amongst them still like other old beetle-headed licorice drones. Avoid them and hate them as they hate you. <laughs> because I do hate him and would hate him yet more. How frequent him. You may see by marriage. Nothing makes a man hate a woman more than her constant conversation. In short, I converse with him, as you do with rich fools, to laugh at him and use a mill. Nah, <laughs> but I would no more sup with women, unless I could lie with them, than sup with a rich coxcomb, unless I could cheat him. Yes, I have known thee sup with a fool for his drinking. If he could set out your hand that way only, you were satisfied. And if he were a wine-swallowing, mouth was enough. Yes, a man drinks often with a fool, as he tosses with a marker, only to keep his hand in your... Uh, but do the ladies drink? Yes, sir. And I shall have the pleasure at la least of laying him flat with a bottle, and bring as much scandal that way upon him as formerly the other. Perhaps you may prove as weak a brother amongst them that way as to the other. <laughs> for, for drinking with women is unnatural as, as scolding with them. It is a pleasure of decayed fornicators and the basest way of quenching love. Nay, it is drowning love instead of quenching it, but uh, leave us for civil women too. <laughs> Aye. When he can't be the better form, we hardly pardon a man that leaves his friend for a wench. And that's pretty lawful. That's a pretty lawful call. Faith, I would not leave you for him if they would not drink. Ha! Ah, who would disappoint his company at Lewis's for a gossiping? No, for wine and women, good apart, uh, together as nauseous as... Sack and sugar, but hearty, sir, before you go, a uh, little of your advice, an old maimed general, when unfit for action, is fittest for counsel. I have other designs upon women than eating and drinking with them. I am in love with Sparkish's mistress, whom he is to marry tomorrow. Now, how shall I? Why, here comes one who will help you to her. He. He, I tell you, is my rival and will hinder my love. No, a foolish rival and a jealous husband assist their rival's designs, for they are sure to make their women hate them, which is the first step to their love for another man. But I cannot come near his mistress but in his company. Still the better for you, for fools are... When they themselves are accessories, and he is to be buried at his... Bob bubbled of his mistress as of his money the common mistress by keeping him company oh who is that 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 is to be bubbled faith let me snack <laughs> i haven't met with a bubble since christmas cat i think bubbles are like brother woodcocks go out with the cold weather <laughs> oh pox he did not hear all i hope oh come you bubbling rogues, you, where do we sup? Oh, our court! My mistress tells me you have been making fierce love to her all the play long. <laughs> but, but I, uh... I make love to her? Nay, 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 I forgive thee, for I think I know thee, and I know her, but I am sure I know myself. Did she tell you so? I see all women are like these of the exchange uh, who, who, to enhance the price of their commodities, report to their fond customers offers which were ne ma never made them. Aye, women are as apt to tell before the intrigue as men after it, and so shew themselves before the vainer sex. But hast thou, Mistress Sparkish, tis as hard for me to believe it. As that thou ever hadst a bubble, as you bragged just now. Oh, your servant, sir. Are you at your rallery, sir? But we were some of us beforehand with you a day at the play. The wits were something bold with you, sir. Did you not hear us laugh? 
Yes, but I thought you had gone to plays to laugh at the poet's wit, not at your own. Oh, your servant. Sir, no, I thank you. Can I, I go to a play as to a country treat? I carry my own wine to one and my own wit to the other, or else I'm sure I should not be merry at either. And the reason why we so often louder than the players is because we think we speak more wit. And so because the poet's arrival in his audience, or to tell you the truth, we hate the silly rogues. <laughs> Nay, so much that we find fault even with their body upon the stage. Whilst we talk nothing else in the pit as loud. But why shouldst thou hate the silly poets? Thou hast too much wit to be one, and they like whores are only hated by each other, and thou dost scorn writing, I'm sure. Yes, I'd have you know I scorn writing, but women, women that make men do foolish things make them write songs too everybody does it tis even as as common with lovers as playing with fans and you can no more help rhyming to your phyllis than drinking to your phyllis nay poetry in love is no more to be avoided than jealousy no oh, but the poets damned your songs did they oh Damn the poets, they turn them into burlesque, as they call it. That burlesque is, is, is a hocus pocus trick they have got, which by the virtue of Hickam's Deoptis, Topus Turvey, they make a wise and witty man in the world. A fool upon the stage, you know, not how. And tis before I hate them too, for I know not but it may be my own case. For they'll put a man into a play for looking a squint. <laughs> their predecessors were content to make serving men only their stage fools. But these rogues must have gentlemen with a pox to them. Nay, knights. And indeed, you shall hardly see a fool upon the stage. But he's a knight. And to tell the truth, they have kept me these six years from being a knight in earnest, for fear of being knighted in a play and dubbed a fool. I blame them not. They must follow their copy, the age. But why should thou be afraid of being in a play, who expose yourself every day in the playhouses and as public places? It is but being on the stage instead of standing on a bench in the pit. Don't you give money to painters to draw you like? And are you afraid of your pictures at length in a playhouse where all your mistresses may see you? A pox. Painters don't draw the smallpox or pimples in one face. Come damned all your silly authors whatever all books and booksellers by the world and all readers contentious or uncontentious but who comes here sparkers oh hi me there's my mistress too uh, she sees you oh but i will not see her tis time to go to whitehall and I must not fail the drawing room. Pray first carry me and reconcile me to her. No, another time. Faith, the king will have supped. Not with the worst stomach for thy absence. Thou art one of those fools that think that attendance at the king's meals is necessary as his physicians, when you are more troublesome to him, to him than his doctors or his dogs. For sure, I know my interests, sir. Prithee, hide me. Your servant, Pinchwife. What he knows us not. Come along. 
Hey, have you any ballads? Give me a six penny worth. We have no ballads. Then give me Covent Garden drollery and a play or two. Oh, here's Targos, Wiles, and the Slighted Maiden. I'll have them. No, plays are not for your reading. Come along. Will you discover yourself? Who is that pretty youth with him, Sparkish? I believe his wife's brother, because he's something like her, but, but I never saw her but once. Extremely handsome. I have seen a face like it too. Let us follow him. Come, Sparkish, uh, your mistress saw you and will be angry you go not to her. Besides, I would fain be reconciled to her, which none but you can do, dear friend. Well, that's a better reason, dear friend. I, I would not go near her now for hers or my own sake, but I cannot deny you nothing. For though I have known thee a great while, never go, if I do not love thee as well as a new acquaintance. I am obliged to you indeed, dear friend. I would be well with her only to be well with thee still, for these ties to wives usually dissolve all ties to friends. I would be contented. She should enjoy you a night, but I would have you to myself a day as I have had, dear friend. And thou shalt enjoy me a days, dear friend. Uh, never stir, and I'll be divorced from her sooner than from thee. Uh, come along. And so we are hard put to it when we make our rival our procurer, but neither she nor her brother would let me come near her now. When all's done, a rival is the best cloak to steal to a mistress under without suspicion, and when we have once got to her as we desire, we throw him off like other cloaks. Exit Sparkish and Harcourt. We enter Mr. Pinchwife, Mistress Pinchwife in man's clothes. Sister, if you will not go, we must leave you. The fool her gallant and she will muster up all the young Santerers of this place, and they will leave their dear seamstresses to follow us. What a swarm of cuckolds and cuckold, cuckold makers are here. Come, let's be gone, Mistress Marjorie. Oh, don't believe that. I haven't half my belly full of sights yet. And walk this way. Lord, what a power of brave signs are here. Stay, the bull's head, the ram's head, the stag's head, dear. Nay, if every husband's proper sign were here were visible, they would all be alike. What do you mean by that, bud? Tis no matter, bud. Pray tell me. Nay, I will know. They would all be bull stags and ram's heads. Come, dear madam, for my sake you shall be reconciled to him. For your sake I hate him. Uh, that's something too cruel, madam, to hate me for his sake. Ah, indeed, madam, too, too cruel of me to hate my friend for my sake. I hate him because he is your enemy, and you ought to hate him too for making love to me if you love me. That's a good one. I hate a man for loving you. If he did love you, tis, tis but we. He can't help, and tis your fault, not his. If he admires you, I hate a man for being of my opinion. I'll ne'er do it by the world. Hm. Is it for your honor or mine to suffer a man to make love to me who and to marry you tomorrow? Is it for your honor or mine to have me jealous? That he makes love to you is a sign you are handsome, and that I am not jealous is a sign you are virtuous, that I think is your honor. But tis your honor too I am concerned for. But why, dearest madam, would he be more concerned for his honor than he is himself? Let his honor alone for my sake and his. Uh, he, he 
has no honor. How's that? But what, my dear friend, can God himself? Oh, oh, oh. that's right again. Uh... Your care of his honor argues his neglect of it, which is no honor to my dear friend here. Therefore, once more, let his honor go which way it will, dear madam. I, 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 I... Were it for my honor to marry a woman whose virtue I sus suspected and could not trust her in a friend's hands? Are you not afraid to lose me? He afraid to lose you, madam. No, no, you may see how the most estimable and most glorious creature in the world is valued by him. Will you not see it? Right, honest Frank. I have that noble value for her that I cannot be jealous of her. You mistake him. He means you care not for me, nor who has me. Lord, madam, I see you are jealous. Will you wrest a poor man's meaning from his words? You astonish me, sir, with your want of jealousy. And you make me goody, sir, madam, with your jealousy and, and fears and virtue and honor. Cat, I see virtue makes a woman as troublesome as a little reading or learning. Monstrous. All right, I was kicked out of the... What page is this, please? Oh, 40. 40. 40, sorry. Um, I got kicked out and I had to, oh, oh, oh damn, uh, uh, Four zero. Okay. Well. <laughs> to see what uh, easy husbands these women of quality can meet with, a poor chambermaid can never have such ladylike luck. Besides, he's thrown away upon her. She'll make no use of her fortune, her blessing, none to a gentleman for a pure cuckold, for it requires good breeding to be a cuckold. Alethea. I tell you then. <laughs> I tell you then plainly, he pursues me to marry me. Oh, be sure. Come, madam, you see, you strive in vain to make him jealous of me. My dear friend is the kindest creature in the world to me. Poor fellow. But his kindness only is not enough for me without your favor, your good opinion, dear madam. Uh, Tis that must perfect my happiness. Uh, good gentleman, he believes all I say. Would you would do so jealous of me? I would not wrong him nor you for the world. Look, look you here. Hear him, hear him, and do not walk away so. I love you, madam, so. Uh, how's that? Nay, now you begin to go too far indeed. So much I confess, I say I love you that I would not have you miserable and cast yourself away upon so unworthy and inconsiderable a thing as what you see here. Oh. No, 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 faith. I believe thou wouldst not. Now his meaning is plain. But I knew before thou wouldst not wrong me nor her. No, no, heavens forbid. The glory of her sex should fall so low as into the embraces of such a contemptible wretch, the last of mankind. My dear friend here, I injure him. Oh. Very well. No, 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 dear friend. I knew it, madam. You see, he would rather wrong himself than me in giving himself such names. Do not you understand him yet? 
Yes, how modestly he speaks of himself, poor fellow. Methinks he speaks impudently of yourself since before yourself too, insomuch as that I can no longer suffer his scurrilous abusiveness to you no more than his love to me. Nay, nay, madam, pray stay his love to you, Lord. Madam, has he not spoke yet plain enough? Yes, indeed, I should think so. Well then. By the world, a man can't speak civilly to a woman now, but presently she says he makes love to her. Nay, madam, you shall stay with your pardon, since you have not yet understood him till he has made an enclarisement of his love to you. That is what kind of love it is. Answer to the catechism. Friend, do you love my mistress here? Yes, I wish she would not doubt it. But how do you love her? With all my soul. I thank him. Methinks he speaks plain enough now. You are out still? But with what kind of love, Harcourt? With the best and truest love in the world. Look you there, then. That is with no matrimonial love, I'm sure. How's that? Do you say matrimonial love is not best? Oh, God, God, I, 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 I went too far in, I was aware. <laughs> Speak for thyself, Harcourt. You said you would not wrong me, nor her. No, no, madam. Ian, take him for heaven's sake. Look you here, madam. Who should in all justice be yours, he that loves you most? Oh. Look you there, Mr. Sparkish, is that? Who, who, who should it be? Go on, Harcourt. Who loves you more than woman, titles, or fortune's fools? Look you there, he means me still, but he points at me. Ridiculous. Who can only match your faith and constancy in love. Aye. Who knows if it be possible how to value so much beauty and virtue. Aye. Whose love can no more be equaled in the world than that heavenly form of yours. No. Who could no more suffer a rival than your absence, and yet could no more suspect your virtue than his own constancy in his love to you. No! Who in fine loves you better than his eyes that first made him love you. No, I, 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 nay, man, faith, you shall go till, uh, Have the care lest you make me stay too long. But till he has saluted you, that I may be assured you are friends after his honest advice and declaration. Come, pray, madam, be, be friends with him. You must pardon me, sir, that I am not yet so obedient to you. What? Invite your wife to kiss men? Monstrous! Are you not ashamed? I will never forgive you. Are you not ashamed that I should have more confidence in the chastity of your family than you have? You must not teach me. I am a man of honor, sir. Though I am frank and free, I am frank, sir. Very frank, sir, to share your wife with your friends. Hmm. He is a humble, menial friend, such as reconciles the differences of the marriage bed. You know, man and wife do not always agree. I design him for that use. Therefore, you'd have him well with my wife. Oh, menial friend. You will get many a menial friends by shooing your wife as you do. But, but then, it, it may be I have a pleasure in it as I have to shoe fine clothes at a playhouse the first day and count money before poor Rose. 
He that shows his wife or money will be in danger of having them both borrowed sometimes. I love to be envied. Then you and would not marry a wife that I alone could love. Loving alone is a dull, as eating alone. Is it not a frank age, and I am a frank person? And to tell the truth, it may be I love to have rivals in my wife. They make her seem to a man still, but as a kip kept mistress. And so good night, for I must to Whitehall. Madam, I hope you are now reconciled to my friend. And so I wish you a good night, and madam, and sleep if you can. For tomorrow, you know, I must visit you early with a conical gentleman. Good night, dear Harcourt. Madam, I hope you will not refuse my visit tomorrow, if it should be earlier, with can canonical gentlemen that, than Mr. Sparkish. This gentlewoman is yet under my care, therefore you must yet forbear your freedom with her, sir. Must, sir? Yes, sir, she is my sister. Well, tis well she is, sir, for I must be her servant, sir. Madam? Come away, sister, we have, we had been gone if, if it had not been for you, and so avoided these lewd rake hells who seem to haunt us. How now, Pinchwife? Oh, your servant? Why, I see a little time in the country makes a man turned wild and unsociable, and only fit to converse with his horses, dogs, and his herds. I have business, sir, and must mind it. Your business is pleasure, therefore you and I must go different ways. Well, you may go on, but this pretty young gentleman. Harcourt. Oh, sorry. the lady. <laughs> oh, and, and the maid shall stay with us, for I suppose their business is the same with ours. Pleasure. Steve, he knows her. He, she carries it so sillily. Yet if he does not, I should be more silly to discover it at first. Hey, let's go, sir. Come, come. I do not rather stay with us. Pretty pinchwife, who is this pretty young gentleman? One to whom I'm a guardian. I wish I could keep her out of her, her, your hands. Who is he? I have never saw anything so pretty in all my life. Pshaw, do not look on him so much. He's a poor bashful youth. You'll put him all out of countenance. Come away, brother. Oh, your brother. Yes, my wife's brother. Come, come, she'll stay supper for us. I thought so, for he is very like her. I saw you at the play with, whom I told you I was in love with. Oh, Jiminy. Is that he who is in love with me? I am glad on it, I vow, for he's a curious fine gentleman and I love him already too. Is that he, bud? Come away, come away. Why, what, has to, what haste are you in? Why won't you let me talk with him? Because you'll debauch him. He's yet young and innocent. I would not have him debauched for anything in the world. How oh, she gazes on him, the devil. <laughs> Dorland, look you here. This is the likeness of that dowdy he told us of, his wife. Did you ever see a lovelier creature? The rogue has reason to be jealous of his wife, since she is like him, for she would make all that see her in love with her. Uh, as I remember now, she is as like him here as can be. She is very pretty, if she be like him. Very pretty, a very pretty commendation. She is a glorious creature, beautiful beyond all things I ever beheld. So, so. More beautiful than a poet's first mistress of imagination. Or another man's last mistress of flesh and blood. Nay, now you jeer. Sir, pray don't jeer me. Come, come! By heaven, she'll discover herself. I speak of your sister, sir. I but saying she was handsome, if like him, made him blush. I'm upon a wreck. <laughs> he thinks he is so handsome, he should not be a man. Oh, there, tis out. 
He's discovered her. I'm not able to suffer any longer. Come, come away, I say. Nay, by your leave, sir, he shall not go. Harcourt, Dorland, let us torment this jealous rogue a little. Oh. I'll show you. Come, pray let him go. I cannot stay fooling any longer. I tell you his sister stays supper for us. Does she? Come then, we'll all go sup with her and thee. No, now I think on it. Having stayed so long for us, I warrant she's gone to bed. I wish she I, I wish she and I were well out of these hands. Come, I must rise early tomorrow. Come. Well then, if she be gone to bed, I wish her and you a good night. But pray, young gentleman, present my humble service to her. Thank you heartily, sir. Yes, she will discover herself yet in spite of me. He is something more civil to you for your kindness to his sister than I am, it seems. Tell her, dear sweet little gentleman, for all your brother there, that you have revived the love I had for her at first sight in the playhouse. But did you love her indeed, and indeed? So, so, away, I say! Well, stay! Yes, indeed, and indeed. Pray do you tell her so, and give her this kiss from me. <gasps> oh, heavens, what do I suffer? Now tis too plain, he knows her, and yet... And this, and this... What do you kiss me for? I am no woman. Oh, so there tis out! Come, I cannot or will not stay any longer. Nay, they shall send your lady a kiss too. Here, Harcourt, Dorland, will you not? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I suffer this. Was I not accusing another just now for this rascally patience in permitting his wife to be kissed before his face? Ten thousand ulcers gnaw away their lips. Come, come. Good night, dear little gentleman. Madam, good night. Farewell, Pinchwife. Did not I tell you I would raise his jealous girl? <sighs> so they are gone at last. Stay, let me see first if the coach be at his door. What, not gone yet? Will you be sure to do as I desired you, sweet sir? Sweet sir, but what will you give me then? Anything. Come away into the next walk. Hold, hold, what you do? Hey, stay, hold. Hold, madam, hold. Let him present him. He'll come presently. Nay, I will never let you go till you uh, answer my question. Uh, for God's sake, sir, I must follow him. Um, no, I have something to present with you with too. You shan't follow them. Pinchwife. Wait, how? Gone with her. Uh, he, he, he's only gone with a gentleman who will give him something and it please your worship. Something? Give him something? With a pox? Where are they? The next walk only, brother. Only, only. Where? Where? What's the matter with him? Why so much concerned? What dearest madam? Pray, let me go, sir. I have said and suffered enough already. Then you will not look upon nor pity my sufferings? To look upon them when I cannot help them were cruelty, not pity. Therefore, I will never see you more. Let me then, madam, have my privilege of a banished lover complaining or railing and give you but a farewell reason why, if you cannot condescend to marry me, you should not take that wretch my rival. He only, not you, since my honor is engaged so far to him, can give me a reason why I should not marry him. But if he be true and what I think him to me, I must be so to him, your servant, sir. Have women only constancy when tis of vice, and like fortune only true to fools? Thou shalt not stir, thou robust creature. You see, I can deal with you, therefore you should stay rather, the rather, and be kind. <laughs> gone? Gone not to be found? Quite gone, ten thousand plagues go with them. Which way went they? But into the other walk, brother. Their business will be done presently, sure. 
before. And please it, Your Worship, it can't be long in doing. I, I, I'm sure on it. Are they not there? No. Y you know where they are, you infamous wretch. Eternal shame of your family, which you do dishonor enough yourself, and you think, but you must help her to do it too, thou legion of bonds. Good brother. Damn, damn sister. Look at here, she's coming. Enter Mistress Pinchwife in man's clothes, running with her hat under her arm, full of oranges and dried fruit, born or following. Oh. Um, here, bud, look, look, dear bud, at what I have got, see? And what have I got here, too, which you can't see? The fine gentleman has given me better things, yes. Has he? So, mm. out of breath and color, I must hold yet. I have only given your little brother an orange, sir. Thank you, sir. You've only squeezed my orange, I suppose, and given it me again, yet I must have a city patience. Come, come away. Oh, stay. Till I have put my fine, it's till I put up my fine things, bud. <laughs> uh, oh, Master Horner, come, come. The lady stay for you. Your mistress, my wife, wonders you make not more haste to her. I have stayed this half hour for you here, and it is your fault I am not now with your wife. Hmm. Well, pray, don't let her know so much. The truth on it is I was advancing a certain project to his majesty about, I'll tell you. No, let's go and hear it at your house. Good night, sweet little gentleman. One kiss more. You'll remember me now, I hope. <laughs> what, Sir Jasper, will you separate friends? He promised to sup with us. And if you take them to your house, you'll be in, da you'll be in danger of our company, too. Alas, gentlemen, my house is not fit for you. There are none but civil women there, which are not for your turn. He, you know, can bear with the society of civil women. Now, ha, ha, ha. Besides, he's one of my family. He's, uh, he, he, he. What is he? Faith, my eunuch, since you'll have it. He, he, he. Oh. <laughs> I rather wish thou were his, or my cockled Harcourt. What a good cockled is lost there. For want of a man to make him one. He and I cannot have Horner's privilege, who can make use of it. <laughs> Aye, to poor Horner. <laughs> Tis like coming to an estate at three score when a man can't be the better for it. Um. Presently, but. Now, oh, uh, come, let us go to Madam, your servant. Good night, strapper. <laughs> Madam, though you will not let me have a good day or night, I wish you one, but uh, dare not name the other half of my wish. Good night, sir. Forever. I don't know why you put this here, dear bud. You shall eat. Nay, you shall have part of the fine gentleman's good things, or treat, as you call it, when we come home. Indeed, I deserve it, since I furnished the best part of it. The gallant treats presents and gives the ball, but this absent cuckold pays for all. Act four, scene one. In Pinchwife's house in the morning, Lucy, Alethea, dressed in new cloths. Well, madam, now I have dressed you and set you out with so many ornaments and spent upon you ounces of essence and pulvilio, and all this for no purpose, but as people adorn and perfume a corpse for a stinking secondhand grave such as, or as bad as I think Mr. Sparkish's bed. Hold your peace. 
Nay, madam, I will ask you the reason why you would banish poor Master Harcourt forever from your sight. How could you be so hard-hearted? It was because I was not hard-hearted. No, no, t'was stark love and kindness, I'll warrant. It was so. I will see him no more because I love him. Hey, day, a pretty reason. You do not understand me. I wish you may yourself. I was engaged to marry, you see, another man, whom my justice will not suffer me to deceive or injure. Can there be a greater cheat or a wrong done to a man than to give him your person without your heart? I should make a conscience of it. I'll retrieve it for him after I am married a while. The woman that marries to love better will be as much mistaken as the uh, uh, as the wretcher that marries to live better. No, madam, marrying to increase love is like gaming to become rich. Alas, you only lose what little stock you had before. I find by your rhetoric you have been bribed to betray me. Only by his merit that has bribed your heart you see against your word and rigid honor. But what is a devil is this honor? Tis sure a disease in the head, like the a megram or, or a falling sickness that always hurries people away to do themselves mischief. Men lose their lives by it. Women, what's dearer to them? Their love, the life of life. Come. By talking no more of honor and our master Harcourt, I wish the other would come to secure my fidelity to him and his right in me. You will marry him then? Certainly. I have already given him my word, and will my hand too to make it good when he comes. Well, I wish I may never stick pin more if he be not an errant natural to the other fine gentleman. I own he wants the wit of Harcourt, which I will dispense with all, for another want he has, which is one of jealousy, which men of wit seldom want. Lord, madam, what should you do with a fool to your husband? You intend to be honest, don't you? Then that hub husbandly virtue, credulity, is thrown away upon you. The only that could suspect my virtue should have cause to do it. To spark his confidence in my truth that obliges me to be so faithful to him. You are not sure his opinion may last. I'm satisfied. It is impossible for him to be jealous after the proofs I have had of him. Jealousy in a husband, heaven defend me from it. It begets a thousand plagues to a poor woman. The loss of her honor, her quiet, and her... And her pleasure. What do you mean, impertinent? Liberty is a great pleasure, madam. I say loss of her honor, her quiet, nay, her life sometimes. And what's as bad almost, the loss of this town. That is, she is sent into the country, which is the last ill usage of a husband to a wife, I think. Oh, doest the wind lie there? Then of necessity, madam, you think a man must carry his wife into the country if he be wise. The country is a terrible, I find, to our young English ladies, as a monastery to those abroad. And on my virginity, I think they would rather marry a London jailer than a high sheriff of a county, since neither can stir from his employment. Formerly, women of wit married fools for a great estate, a fine seat, or the like. But now, tis for a pretty seat only in Lincoln's Inn Fields. St. James Fields, or the Pall Mall. Madam, your humble servant, a happy day to you and to all us. Amen. Who have we here? Oh, my, my chaplain's face. Oh, oh, madam, poor Harcourt remembers his humble servant to you and obedience to your last commands refrains coming into your sight. Is not that he? No, fine, no. But to shew that he there intended to hinder our match has sent his brother here to join our hands. When I get me a wife, I must get her a chaplain according to the custom. This is his brother, 
and my chaplain. The brother? And your chaplain to preach in your pulpit then. His brother. Nay, nay, I I knew you wouldn't not believe it. I told you, sir, she won't take you for your brother Frank. Believe it. His brother? <laughs> he has a trick left still, it seems. Oh, come, my dearest. Pray let us go to church before the conical hours pass. Shane, you're abused still. By the world, tis strange now you are so incredulous. Tis strange you are so credulous. Oh, dearest of my life, hear me. I tell you, I tell you this is Ned Harcourt of Cambridge. By the world, you see he has a speaking college look. Tis true he's something like his brother Frank. And they differ from each other no more than in age. For well, they were twins. <laughs> Your servants, sir. I cannot be so deceived that you are. But come, let's hear. How do you know what you affirm so confidently? Why, I'll tell you all. Frank Harcourt coming to me this morning to wish me joy and present his service to you. I asked him if he could help me to a parson, whereas he told me he had a brother in town who was in orders, and he went straight away and sent him. You see there to me. Yes. Frank goes and puts on a black coat and tells you he is Ned. That's all you have for it. For sure. Push up, push up. I tell you by the same token, the midwife put her garter about Frank's neck to notice the sunder they were so like. Frank tells you this too. Aye, and Ned there? Uh, nay, they are both in a story. So, so, very foolish. Lord, if you won't believe me, you had best fire him by your chambermaid there, for chambermaids must needs no chaplains from other men. They are so used to them. Let's see. Nay, I'll be sworn he has a canonical smirk and the filthy, clammy palm of a chaplain. Well, most reverend doctor, pray let's make an end of this fooling. With all my soul, divine, heavenly creature, when you please. He speaks like a chaplain indeed. Why, was there not so divine, heavenly in what he said? Once more, most impertinent black coat, cease your persecution. And let us get, have a conclusion of this ridiculous love. I had forgot I must suit my style to my coat or I wear it in vain. Well, no more patience left. Let us make once an end of this troublesome love, I say. Uh, so be it, seraphic lady, when your honor shall think it meet and convenient so to do. Dad, I, I'm sure none but a chaplain could speak so, I think. Let me tell you, sir, this dull trick will not serve your turn. Though you delay our marriage, you shall not hinder it. And far be it from me, munific munificent patroness, to delay your marriage. I desire nothing more than to marry you presently, which I might do, if you yourself would. For noble, good-natured, and thrice-generous patron here would not hinder it. No, poor man, not I, say. And now, madam, let me tell you plainly, nobody else shall marry you. By heavens, I'll die first, for I'm sure I should die after it. Oh, his love has made him forget his function, as I have seen it in a real parson's. That mm. was spoken like a chaplain, too. Now you understand him, I hope. Oh, poor man, he takes heinously to be refused. I can't blame him. Tis putting in an indignity upon him not to be suffered. But you will pardon me, madam. It shan't be. He shall marry us. Come away, pray, madam. <laughs> More's ado, tis late. Invincible stupidity. 
I tell you, he will marry me as your rival, not as your chaplain. Come, come, madam. I pray, madam, do not refuse this reverend divine, the honor and satisfaction of marrying you, for I dare say he has set his heart upon it, good doctor. What can you hope or desire by this? I could answer her a reprieve for a day only, often revokes a hasty doom. At worst, if she will not take mercy on me and let me marry her, I have at least the lover's second pleasure, hindering my rival's enjoyment, though, but for the time. Come, madam, it is near twelve o'clock, and my mother charged me never to be married out of the conjunct of conical hours. Come, come, lords, hear such a deal of modesty, I warrant the first day. Yes, and please, your worship, married women show all their modesty the first day because married men show all their love the first day. Come, tell me, I say. Lord, and I told you a hundred times over I would try if in the repetition of the ungrateful tale, I could find her altering it in the least circumstance. For if her story be false, she is so too. Come, how was baggage? Lord, what pleasure you take to hear it, sure. No, you make more in telling it, I find. But speak, how was it? He carried me up into the house, next to the exchange. So, and you two are only in the room? Yes. And he sent away for a youth that was there for some dried fruit and china oranges. Did he so? Damn him for it and, and for... Oh, but presently came up the gentleman of the house. Oh, tis well she did. But what did he do whilst the fruit came? kissed me a hundred times and told me he fancied he kissed my fine sister. Meaning me, you know, when he said he loved with all his soul and bid me be sure to tell her so. And so desire her to be at her window by 11 o'clock this morning and he would walk under it. And he was as good as his word, very punctual. A, a pox toward him, reward him for it. Well, and he said, if you were not within, he would come up to her, meaning me, you know. Bud, still. Still. So, he knew her certainly, but for his con this confession, I'm obliged to her simplicity. But what... But what, you stood very still when he kissed you? Yes, I warrant you. Would you have had me discovered myself? But you told me he, he did some beastliness to you, as you'd call it. What was it? Why, he put... What? Why, he put the tip of his tongue between <gasps> my lips and so muscled me, and I said, I bite it. Ah, eternal canker season for a dog! Nay, you need not be so angry with him neither, for to say truth, he has the sweetest, br sweetest breath I ever knew. The devil! You were satisfied with it then and wouldn't do it again? Not unless he should force me. F force? Changeling, I tell you, no woman can be forced. Yes, but she may sure, by such a one as he, for he's a proper, goodly, strong man. It is hard, let me tell you, to resist him. Oh, so tis plain she loves him, and yet she has not love enough to make her conceal it from me, but the sight of him will increase her aversion for me and love for him. Mm -hmm. Oh, that love instruct her how to deceive me and satisfy him. All oh, idiot as she is, love. Twas he gave a woman first their craft, 
their art of deluding out of nature's hands. They came plain, open, silly, and fit for slaves, as she in heaven intended them. But damn it, love, well, I must strangle the little monster whilst I can deal with him. Go fetch pen, ink, and paper out of the next room. Yes, bud. Why should women have more invention in love than men? It can only be because they have more desires, more soliciting passions, more lust, more of the devil. Come, Minx, sit down and write. I dear bud, but I can't do it very well. I wish you could not do it at all. But what should I write for? I'll have you write a letter to your lover. Oh, Lord, the fine gentleman's a letter. Yes, to the fine gentleman. Lord, you do but cheer, sure you jazz. I am not so merry. Come, write as I bid you. What, do you think I am a fool? She's afraid I would not dictate any love to him. Therefore, she's unwilling, but you had best begin. Indeed, and indeed, but I won't, so I won't. Why? Because he's in town. You may send for him, if you will. Very well. You would have him brought to you? Is it come to this? I say take pen and write, or you'll provoke me. Or do you make me for a fool? Don't I know that letters are never writ, but from the country to London, and from London to the country. Now, he's in town, and I'm in town, too. Therefore, I can't write to him, you know. <laughs> So I am glad it is no worse. She is innocent enough yet. Yes, you may when your husband bids you write letters to people that are in town. Oh, may I say? Then I'm satisfied. Come, begin. Sir? Shan't I say, dear sir? You know, one says always something more than there, sir. Write I as I bid you, or I will write whore with this penknife in your face. Nay, good bud. Though I suffer last night your nauseous, loathed kisses and embraces, write. Nay, why should I say so? You know I told you he had the sweetest breath. Right, Mrs. Pinch wife. Let me but put out loathed. Right, I say, Mrs. Pinchwife. Well, then. Let me see what you have written. Though I suffered last night your kisses and embraces. Thou impudent creature! Where is nauseous and loathed? I can't abide to write such filthy words. Once more write as I'd have you and question it not, or I will spoil thy writing with this. I will stab out those eyes that cause my mischief. Lord, I will. So, so, let me see now. Though I'd suffered last night your nauseous, loathed kisses and embraces, go on, yet. Yeah. Yet I would not have you presume that you shall ever repeat them, so... Hmm. I have read it. On then. I concealed myself from your knowledge to avoid your insul insolences. The same reason I am now out of your hands. So? so mix. Makes me own to you my unfortunate, though innocent frolic, of being in men's clothes. So? That you may forevermore cease to pursue her, who hates and detests you. So, uh, but Why do you sigh? Detest you? As much as she loves her husband and her honor? I vow, husband, he'll ne'er believe I should write such a letter. What? He'd expect kinder from you? Come now, your name only. What? Shan't I say you are most faithful, humble servant till death? No, tormenting fiend. Her style, I find, would be very soft. 
America. Wrap it up now whilst I go fetch wax and candle. And write on the backside for Mr. Horner. For Mr. Horner. So, I am glad he told me his name. Dear Mr. Horner. <laughs> but why should I send thee such a letter that will vex thee and make thee angry with me? Well, I will not send it. I, then my husband will kill me for I see plainly he won't let me love Mr. Horner. But what care I for my husband? I won't. So I won't send poor Mr. Horner such a letter, but then my husband, but oh, but what if I read at the bottom, my husband made me write it. I, then my husband would see it. Hmm. Can one have no shift? Uh, a London woman would have had a hundred presently. Stay. What if I should write a letter and wrap it up like this and write upon two? I, but then my husband would see it. I don't know what to do, but yet I'll try. So I will, for I will not send this letter to poor Mr. Horner. Come that will aunt. Hmm. Hmm. Dear sweet Mr. Horner. So. My husband would have me send you a base, rude, unmannerly letter, but I won't. So, and would have me forbid you loving me, but I won't. So, and would have me say to you, I hate you, poor Mr. Horner, but I won't tell a lie for him there. For I'm sure if you and I were in the country at cards together, so I could not help treading on your toe under the table, so, or rubbing knees with you and staring in your face till you saw me very well. And then looking down and blushing for an hour together, so, but I must make haste before my husband come and now he has taught me to write letters, but shall have <laughs> longer ones from me, who am dear, dear, poor, dear Mr. Horner, your most humble friend and servant to command till death, Marjorie Pinchwife. Stay. I must give him a hint at bottom. So now wrap it up just like any, like the other. So now write for Mr. Horner. But, oh, now what shall I do with it? Oh, here comes my husband. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you, husband. Oh, husband, I think you're on mute. Husband. Mute. Oh, damn, damn these things. I am detained by a sparkish coxcomb who pretended to visit to me, but I fear was to my wife. What have you done? I, I bud just now. Let's see it. What do you tremble for? What? You wouldn't have it, have it go? Here, no, I must not give him that. So I had been served if I, <laughs> and, <laughs> had given him this. Come, where's the wax and seal? Lord, what shall I do now? Nay, then I have it. Pray, let me see it, Lord. Lord, you think? <laughs> okay. Me and Aaron fool, I cannot seal a letter. I, I will do it, so I will. Nay, I believe you will learn that and other things too, which I would not have you. So? Can't I done it, curiously? I think I have. There's my letter going to Mr. Horner, since he'll need have me send letters to folks. Tis very well, but I warrant you wouldn't have it go now. Yes, indeed, but I would, bud, now. Well, you are a good girl, then. 
come let me lock you up in your chamber till I come back and be sure you come not within three strides of the window when I am gone, for I have a spy in the street. At least she's fit, she thinks so if we do. <laughs> not cheat women, they'll cheat us. And fraud may be justly used with secret enemies, of which a wife is the most dangerous. And he that uh, has a handsome boy want to keep in a frontier town must provide against treachery rather than open force. Now I have secured all within. I'll deal with the foe without with false intelligence. <laughs> well, sir, how fadges the new design? Have you not the luck of all your brother projectors to deceive only yourself at last? No, good Domine Doctor. I deceive you, it seems, and others too. For the grave matrons and old rigid husbands think me as unfit for love as they are. But their wives, sisters, and daughters know some of them better things already. Already? Already, I say. Last night I was drunk with half a dozen of your civil persons, as you call them, and people of honor and so was made free of their society and dressing rooms forever hereafter, and have already come to the privileges of sleeping upon their pallets, warming smocks, tying shoes and garters, and the like doctor already, already doctor. You have made use of your time, sir. I tell thee, I am now no more interruption to him when they sing or talk a body than a little squab French page who speaks no English. But do civil persons and women of honor drink and sing body songs? Oh, amongst friends, amongst friends. For your bigots in honor are just like those in religion. They fear the eye of the world more than the eye of heaven and think there is no virtue but railing at vice and no sin but giving scandal. They rail at a poor little kept player and keep themselves some young modest pulpit comedian to be privy to their sins in their closets, not to tell them of them in their chapels. Nay, the truth, aunt, is, priests amongst the women now have quite got the better of us lay confessors, physicians. And they are rather their patients, but now we talk of women of honor. Here comes one. Step behind the screen there, and but observe. If I have not particular privileges with the women of reputation already, doctor, already. Well, Horner, am I not a woman of honor? You see, I'm as good as my word. As you shall see, madam. I'll not be behind hand with you in honor, and I'll be as good as my word, too, if you please but to withdraw into the next room. But first, my dear sir, you must promise to have a care of my dear honor. If you talk a word more of your honor, you'll make me incapable to wrong it. <laughs> to talk of honor in the mysteries of love, is like talking of heaven or the deity in an operation of witchcraft. Just when you are employing the devil, it makes the charm impotent. Nay, fie, <laughs> let us not be snooty, smooty, but you talk of mysteries and bewitching to me. I don't understand you. I tell you, madam, the word money in a mistress's mouth at such a nick of time is not a more disheartening sound to a younger brother than that of honor to an eager lover like myself. But you can't blame a lady of my reputation to be chary. Chary? I have been chary of it already, by the report I have caused of myself. Aye, but if you should ever let other women know that my dear secret, it, 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 it would come out. Nay, you must have a great care of your conduct, for my acquaintances are so censorious. Oh, Tis a, tis a wicked censorious world, Mr. Harner. I say, are so censorious and detracting that perhaps they'll talk to the prejudice of my honor, though you should not let them know the dear secret. Nay, madam, rather than they shall prejudice your honor, I'll prejudice theirs. And to serve you, I'll lie with them all, make the secret their own, and then they'll keep it. <laughs> I'm a Machiavel in love, madam. Oh, no, sir, no, no, not that way. <laughs> Nay, the devil take me, if censorious women are to be silenced any other way. A secret is better kept, I hope, by a single person than a multitude. Therefore, pray, do not trust anybody else with it, dear, dear Mr. Horner. Oh, now, 
Oh, my husband prevented and what's almost as bad found with my arms around another man that will appear too much what shall i say uh, sir jasper come, come hither i am trying if mr horner were ticklish and he's as ticklish as can be i love to torment the confounded toad let you and i tickle him no your ladyship will tickle him better without me i suppose is this your buying china I thought you had been at the China House. China House? That's my cue. I must take it. A pox, can't you keep your impertinent wives at home? Some men are troubled with the husbands, but I with the wives. But I'd have you know, since I cannot be your journeyman by night, I will not be your drudge by day, to squire your wife about, and be your man of straw, or scarecrow only to pies and jays. That would be nibbling at your forbidden fruit. I shall be shortly the hackney gentleman usher of the town. Hey, poor fellow, he's in the right on faith. To squire women about for other folks is as ungrateful an employment as to tell money for other folks. Hey, being an angry uh, horner. No, tis I have more reason to be angry, who am left by you to go abroad indecently alone, or what is more indecent, to pin myself upon such ill-bred people of your acquaintance as this is. Nay, Prithee, what has he done? Nay, he has done nothing. But what do you take ill if he has done nothing? <laughs> Faith, I, I can't but laugh, however. Why do you think the unmannerly toad would not come down to me to the coach? I was fain to come up to fetch him or go without him, which I was resolved not to do. For he knows China very well and has himself very good, but will not let me see it, lest I should beg some. But I will find it out and have what I come for. Lock the door, madam. So, she has got into my chamber and locked me out. Oh, the impertinency of women. Kind. Well, Sir Jasper, plain dealing is a jewel. If ever you suffer your wife to trouble me again here, she shall carry you home a pair of horns. By my Lord Major she shall. Though I cannot furnish you myself, you are sure. Yet I'll find a way. <laughs> my first coming in and finding her arms about him, tickling him, it seems... I was half jealous, but now I see my folly. Hehe, <laughs> poor, poor Horner. Nay, though you laugh now, it will be my turn ere long. Oh, women, more impertinent, more cunning, and more mischievous than their monkeys, and to me almost as ugly. Now she is throwing my things about and rifling all I have. But I'll get into her the back way, and so rifle her for it. <laughs> poor angry Horner. Stay here a little. I'll ferret her out to you presently, I warrant. Wife, my lady Fidget, wife, he's coming into you the back way. Let him come and welcome which way he will. He'll catch you and use you roughly and be too strong for you. Don't you trouble yourself. Let him if he can. This yes, indeed. I couldn't not have believed from him, nor but any my own eyes. Where is this woman, Peter? This toad, this ugly, greasy, dirty sloven. Well, the women all will have him ugly. Methinks he is a comely person, but his wants make his form contemptible to him. And tis even as my wife said yesterday, talking of him, that a proper handsome eunuch was uh, as ridiculous a thing as a gigantic coward. Sir Jasper, your servant, where is this odious beast? He's within his, in his chamber with my wife. She's playing the wag with him. Is she so? And he's a clownish beast. He'll give her no quarter. He'll play the wag with her again. Let me tell you. Come, let's go get her. What, the door's locked? Aye, my wife locked it. Did she so? Let us break it open, then. 
No, no, he'll do her no hurt. No, but is there no other way to get into him? Whither goes this? I will disturb him. Where is this harlotry, this impudent baggage, this rambling tom rig? Oh, Sir Jasper, I'm glad to see you're here. Did you not see my vile grandchild coming hither just now? Yes. Ay, but where is she then? Where is she? Lord Sir Jasper, I have even rattled myself to pieces in pursuit of her. But can you tell me what she makes here? They say below, no woman lodges here. No. No? What does she hear then? Say if it not be a woman's lodging, what makes she here? But are you sure no woman lodges here? No. Nor no man neither. This is Mr. Horner's lodging. Is it so? Are you sure? Yes. Yes. So then there's no hurt in it, I hope. But where is he? He's in the next room with my wife. Nay, if you trust him with your wife, I may be with my Biffy. They say he's a merry, harmless man now, even as harmless a man as ever came out of Italy with a good voice, and as pretty harmless company for a lady as a snake without his teeth. I, I, poor man. I can't find him. Oh, are you here, grandmother? I followed you, you must know, my lady fidget hither. Tis the prettiest lodging, and I have been staring on the prettiest pictures. Uh, I, I have been toiling and moiling for the prettiest piece of china, my dear. Nay, she has been too hard for me to do what I could. Oh, Lord, I'll have some china, too, good Mr. Horner. Don't think to give other people china and me none. Come in with me, too. Upon my honour, I have none left now. <laughs> nay, nay, I have known you deny your china before now, but you shan't put me off so cold. This lady had the last there. Yes, indeed, madam. To my certain knowledge, he has no more left. Oh, but it may be. He may have some. You could not find. What do you think if he had had any left? I would not have had it, too. For we women of quality never think we have enough china. Do not take it all. I cannot make china for you all. But I will have a roll wagon for you, too, <clears throat> another time. Thank you, dear too. What, what do you mean by that promise? Alas, she has an innocent, literal understanding. Oh, Mr. Horner, he has enough to do to please you all, I see. Aye, madam, you see how they use me. Poor oh, gentlemen, I pity you. I thank you, madam. I could never find pity, but from such reverend ladies as you are, the young ones will never spare a man. Come, come, beast, and go dine with us, for we shall want a man at ombre after dinner. That's all their use of me, madam, you see. Come, Slavin, I'll lead you to be sure of you. Alas, poor man, how she tugs him. Kiss, kiss her. That's the way to make such nice women quiet. No, madam, that remedy is worse than the torment. They know I dare suffer anything rather than do it. Kiss her, and I'll give you her picture in little that you admired it so last night. Prithee do. Well, nothing but that could bribe me. I love a woman only in effigy, and good painting as much as I hate them. I'll do it, for I could adore the devil well painted. Why, wow, you filthy toad! Nay, now I've done jesting. <laughs> <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> Ah, a kiss of his. Has no more hurt in it than one of my spaniels. Nor no more good, neither. I will now believe anything he tells me. Oh, Lord, there's a man. Sir Jasper, uh, my, 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 my mask, my mask. I would not be seen here for the world. What not when I am with you? No, 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 my, 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 my honor. Let's be gone. 
Oh, grandmother, let us be gone. Make haste, make haste. I know not how, how he may censure us. Be found in the lodgings of anything like a man? Away! What's here, another cuckold? He looks like one, and none else sure have any business with him. Well, what brings my dear friend hither? Your impertinency. My impertinency? Why, you gentlemen that have got handsome wives think you have a privilege of saying anything to your friends and are as brutish as if you were our creditors. No, sir, I'll ne'er trust you anyway. But why not, dear Jack? Why defied in me? Thou knowest so well. Because I do know you so well. Hadn't I always been thy friend, honest Jack, always ready to serve thee in love and battle before thou wert married, and am so still? I believe so. You would be my second now, indeed. Well then, dear Jack, why so unkind, so grum, so strange to me? Come, prithee, kiss my, me, dear rogue. God, I was always, I say, and am still as much thy servant as... As I am yours, sir. What, would you send a kiss to my wife? Is that it? So there it is. A man can't show his friendship to a married man, but presently he talks of his wife to you. <laughs> really let thy wife alone. Let thee and I be all one, as we were wont. What thou art, as shy of my kindness, as a lumbered street alderman of a courtier's civility at Lockett's. But you are overkind to me, as kind as if I were your cuckold already, and yet I must confess... You ought to be kind and civil to me, since I am so kind, so civil to you, as to bring you this. Look you there, sir. What is it? Only a love letter, sir. Whom? How? This is from your wife. Hmm, and hmm? Even from my wife, sir, and uh, am I not wondrous kind and civil to you now, too? But you'll not think her so. Ha! Is this a trick of his or hers? The gentleman's surprised, I find. What, you expected a kinder letter? No faith, not I. How could I? Yes, yes, I'm sure you did. A man so well made as you are must needs be disappointed. If the women declare not their passion at first sight of opportunity. But what should this mean? Stay the postscript. Be sure you love me whatsoever my husband says to the contrary, and let him not see this, lest he should come home and pinch me or kill my squirrel. It seems he knows not what the letter contains. Come, near wonder at it so much. Faith, I can't help it. No, I think I have deserved your infinite friendship and kindness, and have shewed myself sufficiently an obliging kind of friend and husband. Am I not so, to bring a letter from my wife? To her gallant. Ay, the devil take me, art thou the most obliging, kind friend and husband in the world. <laughs> well, you may be merry, sir, but in short, I must tell you, sir, my honor will suffer no jesting. What dost thou mean? Does the letter want a comment? Then no, sir, though I have been so civil a husband as to bring you a letter from my wife, to let you kiss and quarter to my face. I will not be a cuckold, sir. I will not. Thou art mad with jealousy. I never saw thy wife in my life, but at the play yesterday, and I know not if it were she or no. I court her, kiss her? I will not be a cuckold, I say. There will be danger in making me a cuckold. Why, wert thou not well cured of thy last clap? I wear a sword should be taken from thee, lest thou shouldst do thyself a mischief with it. Thou art a mad man. As mad as I am and as merry as you are, I must have more reason from you ere we part. I say again, though you kissed and courted my wife last night, my wife in man's clothes, as she confesses in her letter. <laughs> Both she and I say you must not design it again, for you have mistaken your woman as you have done your man. Oh, I understand something now. Was that thy wife? Why wouldst thou not tell me twas she? Faith, my freedom was her was your fault, not mine. Faith, so twas. Fie, I'd never do it to a woman before her husband's face, sure. 
but I had rather you should do it to my wife before my face than behind my back, and that you shall never do. No, you will hinder me. If I would not hinder you, you see by her letter, she would. Well, I must e'en acquiesce then, and be contented with what she writes. I'll assure you twas voluntarily writ. I had no hand in it, you may believe me. I do believe thee, Faith. And believe her, too, for she's an innocent creature, has no dissembling in her, and so fare you well, sir. Pray, however present my humble service to her, and tell her I will obey her letter to a title, to a tittle, and fulfill her desires, be what they will, or with what difficulty soever I do it. And you shall be no more jealous of me, I warrant her, and you. Well, then, fare you well, and play with any means of honor, man's honor, but mine. Kiss any man's wife but mine, and welcome. <laughs> Doctor, it seems he has not heard the report of you, or he does not believe it. <laughs> now, Doctor, what think you? Pray, let's see the letter. Hum, for dear love you. I wonder how she could contrive it. What sayest thou to it? It is an original. So are you your cuckolds too original, for they are like no other common cuckolds, and I will henceforth believe it not impossible for you to cuckold the grand signior amidst his guards of eunuchs that I say. And I say for the letter. Is the first love letter that ever was without flames, darts, fates, destinies, lying, and dissembling in it. And to Sparkish, pulling in Mr. Pinchwine. Come back, you are a pretty brother-in-law. Neither go to church, nor to dinner with your sister bride. My sister denies her marriage, and you see has gone away from you dissatisfying. Dissatisfied. Oh, for sure. Upon a foolish scruple that our parson was not in lawful orders and did not say all the common prayer. But in her modesty, only I believe. But let women be never so modest the first day, they'll be sure to come to themselves by night, and I shall have enough of her then. In the meantime, Harry Horner, you must dine with me. I keep my wedding to my aunts in the piazza. Thy wedding? What stale maid has lived for the spare of a husband? Or what young one of a gallant? Oh, your servant, sir. The, the gentleman's sister, then. No stale maid. I'm sorry for it. How comes he so concerned for her? Oh, you're sorry for it? Why, do you know any ill by her? No, I know none but by thee. Tis for her sake, not yours. And another man's sake that might have hoped, I thought. Oh, another man? Another man? What is his name? Nay, no. since tis past, he shall be nameless. Oh, Harcourt, I'm sorry thou missed her. He seems to be much troubled at the match. Really, tell me. Nay, you shan't go, brother. I must of necessity, but I'll come to you to dinner. But Harry, what have I? A rival, a rival in my wife already? But with all my heart, for, for he may be a beauty to me hereafter. Mm. Although my hunger is now my sauce, and I could fall on heartily without but the time will come when a rival will be a good source for a married man to a wife, as an orange to a veal. Oh, thou damned rogue, thou hast set my teeth on edge with thy orange. Ah, then let's go to dinner. There I will with you again. Come. But who dines with thee? My friends and relations, my brother Pinchwipe. You see of your acquaintance. And his wife. No, Gad, he'll never let her come among us good fellows. 
your stingy country coxcomb keeps his wife from his friends as he does his little filkin of ale for his own drinking and a gentleman can't get a smack on but his servants when his back is turned broach it is their pleasure and dust it away <laughs> god i am witty i think concerning i was married today by the world ever but come no i will not dine with you unless you can fetch her too sure what pleasure canst thou have with women now harry my eyes are not gone i love a good prospect yet and will not dine with you unless she does too go fetch her therefore but do not tell her husband it is for my sake well i'll go try what i can do in the meantime come away to my aunt's lodging tis in the way to pinch wives the poor woman has called for aid and stretched forth her hand doctor I cannot but help her over the pail out of the briars. The scene changes to Pinchwife's house. This is Pinchwife along, leaning on her elbow, a table, pen, ink, and paper. Well, tis even so. I have got the London disease they call love. I am sick of my husband and for my gallant. I have heard this distemper called a fever, but methinks tis like an og. Ah, for when I think of my husband, I tremble and am in a cold sweat and have inclinations to vomit. But when I think of my gallant, dear Mr. Horner, my hot fit comes and I am all in a fever and indeed as in other fevers in my own chamber is tedious to me and I would fain to be removed to his and then methinks I should be well oh, poor Mr. Horner well I cannot will not stay here therefore I'll make an end of my letter to him which shall be a finer letter than my last because I have studied it like anything oh sick sick And for Mr. Pinchwife, who, seeing her writing, steals softly behind her and looking over her shoulder, snatches the paper from her. What? Writing more letters? Oh, Lord God! Why did you fright me so? How's this? <laughs> Nay, you shall not stir, madam. Dear, dear Mr. Horner, very well. I have taught you to write letters to good purpose, but let's see it. First, I am to beg your pardon for my boldness in writing to you, which I'd have you to know I would not have done had you not said first you'd love me so extremely, which if you do, you will never suffer me to lie in the arms of another man whom I loathe, nauseate, and detest. Now you can write these silly words, filthy words, but what follows? Therefore, I hope you will speedily find some way to free me from this unfortunate match, which was never, I assure you, of my choice. But I'm afraid tis already too far gone. However, if you love me as I do you, you will try what you can do, but you must help me away before tomorrow, or else, alas, I shall be forever out of your reach, for I can defer no longer our... our... What is to follow our, speak what, our journey into the country, I suppose. Oh, woman, damned woman, and love, damned love. Their old tempter, for this is one of his miracles. In a moment, he can make those blind that could see, and those see that were blind, those dumb that could speak, and those prattle who were dumb before. Nay, what is more than all, make these dough-baked, senseless, indecile animals. Women, too hard for us, their politic lords and rulers, in a moment. But make an end of your letter, and then I'll make an end of you thus, with all my plagues together. Draws his sword. Lord, oh, Lord, you are 
I'm such a passionate man, Bud. Uh, how, how now? What's here to do? This fool here now? What, what, what drawn upon your wife? You should never do that. But what at night in the dark when you can't hurt her? This is my sister-in-law, is it not? Oh, faith in your uh, country, Marguerite. What may know her, come she and you must dine with me. Dinner's ready. Come, but where's my wife? Is she not come home yet? Where is she? Making you a cuckold. Tis what they all do as soon as they can. What? The, the wedding day? No. A, a wife that designs to make a collie of her husband will be sure to let him win the first stake of love. By the world. But come they stay dinner for us. Come, come, I lean down our Marguerite. No, Sergo will follow you. I will not wag without you. This coxcomb is a sensible torment to me amidst the greatest in the world. Um, come, Madam Marguerite. No, I'll lead her my way. What would you treat your friends with mine for one of your own wife? I am contented by rage to take a breath. Well, I told Horner this. Come now. Lord, how shy you are of your wife. But, but, but let me tell you, brother, we men of wit have amongst us the saying that, uh, that cuckolding like the smallpox comes with a fear, and you may keep your wife as much as you will out of danger of infection. But if her con constitution inclines her to, she will have it sooner or later by the world. Say they, uh... What a thing is a cuckold that every fool can make him ridiculous. Uh, well, sir, but let me advise you, now you are come to be concerned because you suspect the danger, not to neglect the means to prevent it, especially when the greatest share of the malady will light upon your own head for... How Sir Kind's wife's belly comes to swell, the husband breeds for her and first is ill. Act five, scene one, Mr. Pinchwife's house. Enter Mr. Pinchwife and Mrs. Pinchwife, a table and a candle. Come, take the pen and make an end of the letter just as you intended. If you are false in a, in a tittle, I shall soon perceive it and punish you with this as you deserve. Write what was to follow. Let's see. You must make else. And haste and help me away before tomorrow, or else I shall forever be out of your reach, for I can defer no longer our what follows our Almost all out then, bud. Look you there then. Let's see. For if I can defer no longer our wedding? Your slighted Alithia? What's the meaning of this? My sister's name to it? Speak, unriddle. Yes, indeed. But why her name to it? Speak, speak, I say. I, but you'll tell her then again, if you would not tell her again. I will not. I'm stunned. My head turns round. Speak. Won't you tell her indeed and indeed? No, speak, I say. She'll be angry with me. No, I had rather she should be angry with me than you, bud. And to tell you the truth, twas she made me write the letter and taught me what I should write. I thought the style was somewhat better than her own, but how could she come to teach you since I had you locked up alone? Oh, through the keyhole, bud. But why should she make you write a letter for her to him, since she can write herself? 
Why? She said, because for I was unwilling to do it. Because what? Because. Because lest Mr. Horner should be cruel and refuse her or vain afterwards and shoo the letter, she might disown it and the hand not being hers. Ah, uh, how's this? Ha! Then I think I shall come to myself again. This changeling couldn't invent this lie, but if she could, why should she? She might think I should soon discover it. Stay. Now I think on it too. Horner said he was sorry she had married Sparkish, and her disowning her marriage to me makes me think she has evaded it. For Horner's sake, yet why should she take the course? But men in love are fools, women may well be so. But, but hark you, madam, your sister went out in the morning, and I have not seen her within since. Alack a day, she has been crying all day above it, it seems, in a corner. Where is she? Let me speak to her. Oh, Lord, then he'll discover all. Pray hold, bud. Would you mean to discover me? She'll know. I have told you then. Pray, bud, let me talk first. I must speak with her to know whether Horner ever made any promise and whether she be married to Sparkish or no. Pray, dear bud, don't. Till I have spoken with her and told her that I have told you all, for she'll kill me. Go then and bid her come out to me. Yes, yes, but let me see. I'll go, but she is not within to come to him. I'll have to go. I'll, I have just got time to know of Lucy, her maid, who first set me on work. What lie I shall tell next, for I am a bit my wit's end. Well, I resolve it. Horner shall have her. I'd rather him my sister than lend him my wife. And such an alliance will prevent his pretensions to my wife, sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll make of him kin to her, and then he will care for her. Oh, Lord, but I told you what anger you would make me with my sister. Oh, well, won't she come hither? No, no, alack a day. She's ashamed to look you in the face, and she says if you go into her, she'll run away downstairs and shamefully go herself to Mr. Horner who has promised her marriage, she says, and she will have no other, so she won't. Did she, he so, promise her marriage? Then she shall have no other, go tell her so. And if she will come and discourse with me a little concerning the means, I will about it immediately go. His estate is equal to Sparish's, and his extraction is much better than his, as his parts are. <laughs> My chief reason is I'd rather be of kin to him by name of brother-in-law than that of Cookhold. Well, what says he now? Why, she says she would only have you lead her to Horner's lodging, with whom she first will discourse the matter before she talk with you. Which yet she cannot do, for alack, poor creature, she says she can't so much as look you in the face. Therefore, she'll come to you in a mask... <laughs> and you must excuse her if she make no answer to any question of yours till you have brought her to Mr. Horner. And if you will not chide her nor question her, she'll come out to you immediately. Oh, let her come. I will speak not a word to her, nor, oh. nor require a word from her. I forgot. Besides, she says she cannot look you in the face. The rue the mask. Therefore would desire you to put out the candle. <laughs> I agree to all. Let her make haste. There, tis out. My case okay. is something better. I'd rather fight with Juana for not lying with my sister than for lying with my wife. And of the two, I'd rather find my sister too forward than my wife. I expected no other from her free education, as she calls it. And her passion for the town, well, wife and sister are names which may just make us expect love and duty, pleasure and comfort. But we find them plagues and torments and are equally, though differently, troublesome to their keeper. 
for we have as much ado to get people to lie with our sisters as to keep them from lying with our wives. Enter Mrs. Pinchwife, masked, in hoods and scarves, and a nightgown and petticoat of Alethea's in the dark. What are you come, sister? Let us go, then. But first, let me lock up my wife. Mrs. Marjorie, where are you? I hear bud. Come hither that I may lock you up. Get you in. Come, sister, where are you now? She locks the door. Mrs. Pinchwife gives him a hand, but when she lets her go, she steals softly onto the other side of him and is led away by him for his sister, Alethea. The scene changes to Horner's lodging, Quack Horner. What all alone, not so much as one of your cuckolds here, nor one of their wives. They used to take their turns with you as if they were to watch you. Yes, it often happens that a cuckold is but his wife's spy and is more upon family duty when he is with her gallant abroad, hindering his pleasure, than when he is at home with her playing the gallant. But the hardest duty a married woman imposes upon a lover is keeping her husband's company always. And this fondness wearies you almost as soon as hers. A pox. Keeping a cuckold company after you have had his wife is as tiresome as the company of a country squire to a witty fellow of the town when he has got all his money. And as it, and as at first a man makes a friend of the husband to get the wife, so at last you are fain to fall out with the wife to be rid of the husband. All right. Most cuckold makers are true courteous. When once a poor man has cracked his credit for him, they can't abide, they can't abide to come near him. But at first to draw him in are so sweet, so kind, so dear, just as you are to pinch wife. But what becomes of that intrigue with wife? A pox he's as sorely as an alderman that has been bit, and since he's so coy, his wife's kindness is in vain. For she is a silly innocent. Did she not send you a letter by him? Yes, but that's a riddle I have not yet solved. Allow the poor creature to be willing. She is silly too, and he keeps her up so close. Yes, so close that he makes but her but the more willing, and adds but revenge to her love, which two, when met, seldom fail of satisfying each other one way or other. Well, here's the man we are talking of, I think. Enter Mr. Pinchwife leading in his wife, masked, muffled, and in her sister's gown. Pshaw! Bringing his wife to you is the next thing to bringing a love letter from her. What means this? The last time you know, sir, I brought you a love letter. Now you see a mistress. I think you'll say I am a civil man to you. Aye, the devil take me. Will I say thou art the civilest man I ever met with? And I have known some. I fancy I understand thee now, better than I did the, the letter. But hark thee in thy care. What? Nothing but the usual question, man. Is she found on thy word? What, you take her for a wench and me a pimp? Pshaw, wench and pimp. Foul words. I know thou art an honest fellow, and hast a great acquaintance among the ladies, and perhaps hast made love for me rather than let me make love to thy wives. Come, sir, in short, I am for no fooling. Nor I neither. Therefore, prithee, let's see her face presently. Make her show man. Art thou sure I don't know her? I am sure you do know her. Pox, why dost thou bring her to me then? Because she's a relation of mine. Is she faith, man? Then thou art still more civil and obliging, dear rogue. Who desired me to bring her to you? Then she is obliging, dear rogue. You'll make her welcome for my sake, I hope. I hope she is handsome enough to make herself welcome. Prithee, let her unmask. Do you speak to her? She would have never be ruled by me. Madam, she says she must speak with me in private. Withdraw, Prithee. She's unwilling, it seems, I should know all her indecent conduct in this business. Well, well then, he leave you together and hope when I am gone you'll agree, if not... You and I shan't agree, sir. What means the fool? If she and I agree, it is no matter what you and I do. 
In the meantime, I'll fetch a parson and find out Sparkish and disabuse him. You won't have me fetch a parson, would you not? Well, well then, now I think I am rid of her and shall have no more trouble with her. Our sisters and our daughters like usurers' money are safest when put out. But our wives, like their writings, never safe, but in our closets, under lock and key. Exit Pinchwife, enter boy. Sir Jasper Fidget, sir, is coming up. Here's the trouble of a cuckold. Now we are talking of, pox on him. Has he not enough to do to hinder his wife's sport? But he must other women's too? Step in here, madam. Mm. My best and dearest friend. The old style doctor. I'll be short, for I am busy. What would your impertinent wife have now? Well, guess you be faith, for I do come from her. To invite me to supper? Tell her I can't come. Go. Nay, now you are out. Now you are out of faith. For my lady and the whole knot of the virtuous gang, as they call themselves, are resolved upon a frolic of coming to you tonight in a masquerade, and are all dressed already. I shan't be at home. But how true is she is to women. Nay, pretty don't disappoint them. They'll think tis my fault. Pretty don't. I'll send in the banquet and the fiddles, but make no noise on it. For the poor virtuous rogues would not have it known for the world that they go a masquerading, and they would come to no man's ball but yours. Oh, well, get you gone and tell them if they come, it'll be at the peril of their honor and yours. <laughs> we'll trust you for that. Farewell. Dr. Anon, you too shall be my guest, but now I'm going to a private feast. The scene changes to the piazza of Covent Garden, Sparkish, Pinchwife, Spark, Sparkish with a letter in his hand. But who would have thought a woman would have been false to me? You were forgiving and taking liberty. She has taken it only, sir. Now you find in that letter you are a frank person, and so is she you see there. Nay, if, if this be her hand, for I never saw it. Well, tis no matter whether that be her hand or no. I'm sure this hand at her desire lead her to Mr. Horner, with whom I left her just now, to go fetch a parson to him at their desire too, to deprive you of her forever, for it seems yours was but a mock marriage. Indeed, she would needs have it that she was Hawkart himself in a parson's habit, who had married us. But I'm sure she told me twice his brother Ned. <laughs> oh, there tis out, and you were deceived, not she, for you are such a frank person. But I must be gone. You'll find her at Mr. Horner's. Go in and believe your eyes. Nay, I'll to her and call her as many crocodiles, sirens, harpies, and other heathenish names as a poet would do a mistress, whom has refused to her his suit, nay, more his verses on her. But stay, is not that she following a torch at the other end of the piazza, and from Horner's certainly? Tis so! You are well met, madam. No, you don't think so. What, you have made short visit to Mr. Horner, but I suppose you'll return to him presently. By that time, the parson can be with him. Mr. Horner and the parson, sir. Come, madam. No more dissembling, no more jilting, for I am no more a frank person. How's this? Oh, twill work, I see. Could you find out no easy country fool to abuse? None but me, a, a gentleman of wit and pleasure about the town? But it was your pride to be too hard for a man of pots, unworthy, false woman. False as a friend that lends a man money to lose. False as dice 
who undo those that trust all they have to him. He has been a great bobble by his similes, as they say. You've been too merry, sir, at your wedding dinner, sure. What? You mock me too? Or you have been deluded. By you? Let me understand you. Have you the confidence? I should call it something else, since you know your guilt to stand my just reproaches. You did not write an impudent letter to Mr. Horner, who I find now has clubbed with you in deluding me with his aversion for women, that I might not forsooth suspect for my rival. Do you think the gentleman can be jealous now, madam? I write a letter to Mr. Horner? Nay, madam, do not deny it. Your brother showed it me right now, and told me likewise he left you at Horner's lodging to fetch Parsons to marry you to him. And I wish you joy, madam, joy, joy, and to him too much joy, and to myself more joy for not marrying you. <laughs> So I found my brother would break off the match. I can consent to it, since I see this gentleman can be made jealous. Oh, Lucy, by his rude usage and jealousy, he makes me almost afraid I am married to him. I've got shorts was Harcourt himself and no parson that married us. No, madam. I thank you. I suppose that was contriving two of Mr. Horner's and yours to make Harcourt play the parson. But I would as little as you have him won now. No, not for the world. For shall I tell you all the truth? I never had any passion for you till now. For well, now I hate you. It's true I might have married your passion as other men of parts of the town do sometimes and do your servant and to shew my unconcernedness. I'll come to your wedding and resign you with as much joy as I would a stale wench to a new collie. Nay, with as much joy as I would after the first night. If I had been married to you, there's for you. And so your servant, servant. How was I deceived in a man? Well, but you believe then a fool may made jealous now, hmm? For that easiness in him that suffers him to be led by a wife will likewise permit him to be persuaded against her by others. But marry Mr. Horner? My brother does not intend it, sure. If I thought he did, I would take thy advice of Mr. Harcourt for my husband. And now I wish that if there were any be an overwise woman of the town who, like me, would marry a fool for fortune, liberty, or title that her husband may love play and be a collie to all the town. But her, and suffer none but fortune to be mistress of his purse, then if for liberty, that he sent her into the country under the conduct of housewifely mother-in-law. And if for title, may the world give him none but that couple. And for her greater curse, madam, may he not deserve it. Oh, impertinent. Is not this my old lady, Lanterless? Yes, madam. And here I hope we shall find Mr. Harcourt. The scene changes again to Horner's lodging. Horner, Lady Fidget, Miss Dainty Fidget, Miss Squeamish, a table, bank, <laughs> and bottles. A pox, they are come too soon before I have sent back my new mistress. All I have now to do is to lock her in, that they may not see her. That we may be sure of our welcome. We have brought our entertainment with us and our resolve to treat thee, dear Toad. And that we may be merry to purpose, have left Sir Jasper and my old lady squeamish quarreling at home in bad hammer. Therefore, let us make use of our time, lest they should enchant to interrupt. Let us sit, then. First, that you may be private, let me lock this door, and that, and I'll wait upon you presently. No, sir. 
shut him only, and your lips forever, for we must trust you as much as our women. You know all vanities killed in me. I have no occasion for talking. Now, ladies, supposing we had drank each of us our two bottles, let us speak the truth of our hearts. Agreed. By this brimmer, for truth is nowhere else to be found. Not in thy heart, false man. You have found me a true man, I'm sure. Not in every way, but let us sit and be merry. And now I'm going to sing. Why should our damned tyrants oblige us to live on the pittance of pleasure which they only give? We must not rejoice with wine and with noise. In vain we must wake in a dull bed alone. Whilst to our warm rival the bottle they've gone, they'll lay aside charms and take up their arms. Tis wine only gives them their courage and wit. Because we live sober to men we submit. If for bounty beauties you'd pass, take a lick of the glass. Twill mend your complexions, and when they are gone, the best red we have is the red of the grape. Then sisters, lay it on, and damn a good shape. Dear Brimmer, mm. well in token of our openness and plain dealing, let us throw our masks over our heads. So it will come to the glasses and all. Lovely Brimmer, let me enjoy him first. No, I never part with the gallant till I've tried him. <laughs> Dear Bremer, that maketh our husbands short-sighted. And our bashful gallants bold. And for want of a gallant, the butler lovely in our eyes. Drink, you. Drink, thou representative of a husband. Damn a husband. And as it were a husband, an old keeper. An old grandmother. And an English bard and a French cheer aye, chirurgeon. We have, aye, we have all reason to curse them. For my sake, ladies. No, for our own, for the first spoils of all young gallants industry. And the others, art makes them bold only with common women. And rather run the hazard of the vile distemper amongst them than of a denial amongst them. The filthy toads choose mistresses now, as they do stuffs for having been fancied and worn by others. For being common and cheap. While women of quality, like the richest stuff, buy untumbled and unmasked for. I meet. For. I meet and cheap and new often they think best. No, sir, the beast will be known by a mistress longer than by a suit. And it is not for the cheapness neither. No, for the vain fops will take up druggets and embroider them. But I wonder at the depraved appetites of witty men. They used to be out of the common road and hate imitation. Pray tell me, beast, when you were a man, why you rather chose to club with a multitude in a common house for an entertainment than to be the only guest at a good table? Why, faith, ceremony, and expectation are unsufferable to those that are sharp bent. People always eat with the best stomach at an ordinary, but every man is snatching for the best bit. Though he get a cut uh, over the fingers, but I've heard people eat most heartily of another's man's meat. That is what they do not pay for. When they are sure of their welcome and freedom, for ceremony in love and eating is as ridiculous as in fighting. Falling on briskly is all should be done in those occasions. Well, then let me tell you, sir, there is nowhere more freedom than in our houses. And we take freedom from a young person as a sign of good breeding. And a person may be as free as he pleases with us, as frolic, as gamesome, as wild as he will. Mant, I heard you all declaim against wild men. Yes, but for all that, we think wildness in a man is desirable a quality, as in a duck or a rabbit, a tame man. <laughs> I know not, but your reputations frightened me as much as your faces invited me. Our reputation, Lord. Why should you not think that we women make use of our reputation as you men of ours, only to deceive the world with less suspicion? Our virtue is like the statesman's religion, the Quaker's word, the gamester's oath, and the great man's honor but to cheat those who trust us. And that demureness, coyness, and modesty, 
that you see in our faces in the boxes it plays is as much a sign of a kind woman ever as a wizard mask in the pit. For I assure you, women are least masked when they have the velvet wizard on. You would have found us modest women in our denials only. Our bashfulness is only the reflection of the men. We blush when they are shamefaced. I beg your pardon, ladies. I was deceived in you devilishly. But why? That mighty pretense to honor. We have told you. But sometimes, twas for the same reason you men pretend business often, to avoid ill company, to enjoy the better and more privately those you love. But why? Would you ne'er give a friend a wink, then? Faith, your reputation frightened us as much as ours did you. You were so notoriously lewd. And you so seemingly honest. <laughs> Was that all that deterred you? And so expensive. <laughs> you allow freedom, you say? Aye, aye. That I was afraid of losing my little money, as well as my little time, both which my other pleasures required. Money, pfft. You talk like a little fellow now. Do such as we expect. Money? I beg your pardon, madam. I must confess, I have heard that great ladies, like great merchants, set but the higher prizes upon what they have because they are not in necessity of taking the first off. Such as we make sale of our hearts. We bribe it for our love. Fall! With your patience, ladies, I know, like great men in offices, you seem to exact flattery and attendance only from your followers. But you have receivers about you, and such fees to pay. A man is afraid to pass your grants. Besides, we must let you win at cards, or we lose your hearts. And if you make an assignation, tis at a goldsmith's, jeweler's, or china house, but for your honor, you deposit to him. He must pawn his, to the punctual sit, and so paying for what you take up, pays for what he takes up. Would you not have us assured of our gallant's love? For well, love is better known by liberality than by jealousy. For one may be dissembled, the other not. But my jealousy can be no longer dis dissembled, and they are telling ripe. Come, here's to our gallants in waiting, whom we must name, and I'll begin. This is my false rogue. <laughs> so all will out now. Did you not tell me it was for my sake only? You reported yourself no man. O oh, wretch, did you not swear to me, t'was for my love and honor, you passed for that thing you do? So, so. Um, speak, ladies. This is my false villain. And mine, too. And mine. Well, then, you are all three my false rogues, too. And there's an end on it. Well, then, there's no remedy, sister sharers. Let us not fall out but have a care of our honor. Though we get no presents, no jewels of him, we are savers of our honor. The jewel of most value and use, which shines yet to the world's unsuspecting, though it be counterfeit. Nay, and as e'en as good, as it were true, provided the world thinks so. For honor, like beauty now, only depends on the opinion of others. Well, Harry Common, I hope you can be true to three swear but tis no purpose to require your oath for you are as often forsworn as you swear to new women come faith madam let us e'en pardon one another for all the difference i find betwixt me men and you women we forswear ourselves at the beginning of an amour you as long as it lasts oh my lady fidget was this your coming, a cunning to come to Mr. Horner without me? But you have been nowhere else, I hope. No, Sir Jasper. And you came straight hither, Biddy. Yes, indeed, Lady Grandmother. Tis, <laughs> tis well, tis well. I knew when once they were thoroughly acquainted with poor Horner, they'd ne'er be from him. You may let her masquerade it with my wife and Horner, I warrant her reputation safe. And the boy. Oh, oh, sir. Oh, yeah, I got it. Oh, sir. Here's the gentleman's come. 
whom you bid, bid me not suffer to come up without giving you notice, with a lady too, and other gentlemen. Do you all go in there, while, whilst I send him away? And boy, do you desire him to stay below till I come, which shall be immediate? Yes, sir. You would not you would not take my advice to be gone home before your husband came back. He'll now discover all. Yet pray, my dears, be persuaded to go home and leave the rest to my management. I'll let you down the back way. I don't know the way home, so I don't. My man shall wait upon you. No, don't you believe that I'll go at all? What? Are you weary of me already? Oh, my life, tis that I may love you long. Tis to secure my love and your reputation with your husband. I'll never receive you again else. What care I? Do you think to frighten me with that? I don't intend to go to him again. You shall be my husband now. I cannot be your husband, dearest, since you are married to him. Oh, would you make me believe? Don't I see every day in London here women leave their first husband and go and live with other men as their wives? Pish, pshaw. Such a beautiful girl. Oh, it's beautiful. You make me angry, but that I love you so mainly. So they are coming up. In again, in. I hear him. Well, a silly mistress is like a weak place. Soon got, soon lost, and a man has scarce time for plunder. She betrays her husband, first to her gallant, and then her gallant to her husband. Enter Pinchwife, Alethea, Harcourt, Sparkish, Lucy, and a person. Oh, madam, tis not the sudden change of your dress, the confidence of your asservations, and your false witness there shall persuade me. I did not bring you hither just now. Here's my witness, who cannot deny it, since you must be confronted. Mr. Horner, did I bring, did I, did not I bring this lady to you just now? Now must I wrong one woman for another's sake? That's no thing, that's no new thing with me. For in these cases, I am still on the criminal side against the innocent. Speak, sir. It must be so. I must be impudent. Let's try my luck. Impudence used to be too hard for truth. What, are you studying an evasion or an or excuse for her to speak, sir? No, Faith. I am something backward only to speak in women's affairs or disputes. She bids you speak. Aye, pray, sir, do. Pray satisfy him. Then truly, you did bring that lady to me just now. Oh, ho! Sir! Oh, Honor. What mean you, sir? I always took you for a man of honor. I so much a man of honor that I must save my mistress. I thank you. Come what will on it. So if, if I had had her, she'd have made me believe the moon had been made of Christmas pie. Now could I speak, if I durst, and solve the riddle, who am the author of it? Oh, unfortunate woman. The combination against my honor, which most concerns me now, because you share my disgrace, sir, and it is your censure which I must now suffer that troubles me, not theirs. Madam, then have no trouble. You shall now see it is possible for me to love too without being jealous. I will not only believe your innocence myself, but make all the world believe it. Honor, I must now be concerned for this lady's honor. I must be concerned for a lady's honor too. This lady has her honor and I will protect it. My lady has not her honor, but has given it me to keep and I will preserve it. I understand you not. I would not have you. Mrs. Pinchwife. What's keeping from matter? behind. What's the matter with them all? Come, come, Mr. Horner, no more disputing. Here's the parson. I brought him not in vain. No, sir, I'll employ him, if this lady please. Ha! What do you mean? Uh, wh wh what does he mean? Why, 
I have resigned your sister to him. He has my consent. But he has not mine, sir. A, woman in, a woman's injured honor, no more than a man's, can be repaired or satisfied by any but him that first wronged it. And you shall marry her presently, or... He lays hand on the sword. Oh, Lord! Just... They'll kill poor Mr. Horner. Besides, he shan't marry her whilst I stand by and look on. I'll lose my second husband, so... What do I see? My sister in my clothes. <gasps> Nay, pray now don't quarrel about finding work for the parson. He shall marry me to Mr. Horner. For now I believe you have enough of me. Damned, damned loving changeling. Pray, sister, pardon me for telling so many lies to you. I suppose the riddle is plain now. No, that must be my work. Good sir, hear me. I will never hear woman again, but make them all silent thus. No, that must not be. You then shall go first. Tis all one to me. Hold. What's the matter? What's the matter? Pray, what's the matter, sir? I beseech you, communicate, sir. Uh, why, my wife has communicated, sir, as your wife may have done too, sir. If she knows him, sir. Shaw sure, with him? <laughs> Do you mock me, sir? A cuckold is a kind of wild beast. Have a care, sir. No, sir, you mock me, sir. He cuckold you. It can't be. <laughs> Why, I'll tell you, sir. I tell you again, he has whored my wife, and yours too, if he knows her, and, and all the women he comes near. <laughs> Tis not his dissembling, his hypo hypocrisy can wheedle me. How does he dissemble? Is he a hypocrite? Nay, then how, wife, sister, is he a hypocrite? An hypocrite, a dissembler, speak, young horatory, speak how. Nay, then, oh, my head too. Oh, thou libidious lady. Oh, thou horating horatory, hast thou don't then? Speak, good horner. Art thou a dissembler, a rogue, hast thou? No. Set you off, and her too, if she will but hold her tongue. Canst thou? I'll give thee. Uh, 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 pray, uh, ha have but patience to hear me, sir, who am the unfortunate cause of all this confusion. Your wife is innocent, I only culpable, for I put her upon telling you all these lies concerning my mistress in order to the breaking off the match between Mr. Sparkish and her to make way for Mr. Harcourt. Did you... So eternal rotten tooth that it seemed my mistress was not false to me. I was only deceived by you. Brother, that should have been the man of conduct who, who is a frank person now to bring your wife to her lover. <laughs> I, I, I assure you, sir, she came not to Mr. Horner out of love, for she loves him no more. Hold! I told lies for you, but you shall tell none for me, for I do love Mr. Horner with all my soul, and nobody shall say me nay. Pray, don't you go to make poor Mr. Horner believe to the contrary. Tis spiteful done of you, I'm sure. Peace. Dear idiot. Hey, I will not peace. Until I make you. Enter Darlington Quack. Honor, your servant. I am the doctor's guest. He must excuse our intrusion. But what's the matter, gentlemen? For heaven's sake, what's the matter? Oh, tis well you are come. It's a censorious world we live in. 
you may have brought me a reprieve, or else I had died for a crime I never committed, and these innocent ladies had suffered with me. Therefore, pray satisfy these worthy, honorable, jealous gentlemen. That. Oh, I understand you. Is that all? Sir Jasper, by heavens and upon the word of a physician. Sir? Nay, I, I do believe you truly. Pardon me, my virtuous lady and dear of honor. What then all's right again? Aye, aye, and now let us satisfy him too. They whisper with Mr. Pinchwife. Eunuch, pray no fooling with me. I'll bring half the surgeons, surgeons. surgeons in town to swear it. They, they'll swear a man that bled to death through his wounds died of an apoplexy. Pray hear me, sir, why all the town has heard the report of him. But does all the town believe it? Pray inquire a little, and first of all these. I'm sure when I left the town, he was the lewdest fellow in it. I tell you, sir, he has been in France since pray. Uh, since pray ask but these ladies and gentlemen, and your friend, Mr. Dor Dorlean, gentlemen and ladies, hasn't had you all heard the late sad report of poor Mr. Horner? Aye, aye. 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 <laughs> oh, what, no. thou jealous fool, dost thou doubt it? Doubt it? He's an errant French capon. <laughs> His fault, sir. You shall not disparage poor Mr. Horner, for to my certain knowledge. Oh, hold, 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 hold. Stop a bow. Uh, upon my honor, sir, tis as true. Do you think we would have seen him in his company? Trust our unspotted reputations with him? This you get, and we too, by trusting your secret to a fool. Peace, madam. Well, doctor, this is not a good design that carries a man on unsuspected and brings him off safe. Well, if this were true, but my wife... Come, brother. Your wife is yet innocent, you see. But have a care of too strong an imagination. Least like an overconcerned timorous gamester by fancying an unlucky cast should come. Women of fortune are truly still to those that trust them. And any wild thing grows, but the more fierce and hungry for being kept up and more dangerous to the keeper. Oh. There's a doctrine for all husbands, Mr. Harcourt. I edify, madam, so much that I am impatient till I am one. And I edify so much by example. I will never be one. <laughs> and, and because I will not disparage my pots, I'll never be one. And I, alas, can't be one. Uh, I must be one against my will to a country wife with a country murrain to me. And I must be a country wife still to, I find, for I can't, like a city one, be rid of my musty husband and do what I list. Now, sir, I must pronounce your wife innocent, though I blush whilst I do it. And I am the only man by her now exposed to shame, which I will straight drown in wine, as you shall your suspicion, and the lady's troubles will divert with a ballet. Doctor, where are your maskers? Indeed, she's innocent, sir. I am her witness, and her end of coming out was but to, to see her sister's wedding, and what she has said to your face of her love to Mr. Horner was but the usual innocent revenge on the husband's jealousy. Was it not, madam? Speak. Since you'll have me tell more lies. Yes, indeed, bud. For my own sake, faint I would all believe. Cuckolds like lovers should themselves deceive. But his honor is at least safe, too late I find, who trust us with foolish wife or a friend. A dance of cuckolds. <laughs> Vain fox, but court and dress and keep a puther to pass for women's men with one another. 
But he who aims by women to be prized, first by the men, you see, must be despised. Epilogue. Now you the vigorous, who daily hear, or visit masked in public domineer, and what you do to her, if in place where, may have the confidence to come cry out, yet when she says lead on, you are not stout, but to your well-dressed brother straight turn round and cry, Box on her Ned, she can't be sound, and slink away, a fresh one to engage, with so much seeming heat and loving rage, you'd frighten listening actress on the stage, till she at last has seen you huffing come, and talk of keeping in the tiring room. It cannot be provoked to lead her home. Next, you false doubts of fifty, who beset your buckram maidenheads, which your friends get, and whilst to them you of achievements boast, they share the booty and laugh at your cost. In fine, you essenced boys, both old and young, who would be thought so eager, brisk, and strong, yet do the ladies, not their husbands, wrong, whose purses for your manhood make excuse, and keep your Flanders mares for sure, not use, encouraged by our woman's man today, a horner's part may vainly think to play, and may intrigue so bashfully disown that they may doubted be by few or none, may kiss the cards at picket, ombre, lou, and so be thought to kiss the lady too. But gallants, have a care of faith, what you do, the world which to no man his due will give, you by experience know you can deceive. And men may still believe you vigorous, but then we women, <laughs> there's no cousining us. Whoa. <laughs> Four hours later. Oh. Oh.